Come on. They're right there. Let's go. Move, 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 move. This episode of Choices Not Chances podcast is sponsored by Louisiana Gun Shop. Located on Highway 90 West in Broussard, Louisiana, just south of Lafayette. For more information, stay tuned at the end of this episode. This is Choices Not Chances podcast with Ryan and Matt. I'm your co-host, Matthew Charette. Sit next to me is Ryan Rogers. Ryan? All right, guys. Hey, next episode of Choices Not Chances, and we're shifting gears a little bit. We're going to be talking to one of my uh, good friends, Robert Hurl, and a.k.a. Shrek. And um, Shrek is a painter. Uh, Shrek was a career firefighter, a uh, firefighter in the Army, served with the 562nd and uh, the 5th Engineer Attachment, uh, civilian government firefighter, 15-plus years uh, fighting fires, uh, and doing everything involved in that, which is clean up forestry, uh, back burns, diving, paramedic, car accidents, water, everything uh, that you could think. He had a illustrious career full of service to other people. Um, like I said, diving paramedic. He was a nurse medic and spent a little bit of time on fixed. Was it fixed wing life flight? Yeah, it was. And then uh, served. Uh, um, with honor let's say during katrina uh, hurricane katrina katrina and uh, hurricane rita and uh, and so i met i met robert uh, like five years ago six years ago around there and uh, we met in a group both of us struggling with you know demons of the past and what have you and trying to get our lives together for for families and kids and you know and ourselves and uh so we started going to a group together uh not together initially we met there and then kind of uh had a you know a lifelong friendship bond uh coming out of that and um i am not artistic uh i do not use art for therapy other than looking at it i have a couple of art pieces that shrek uh has made hanging in my house and and i believe in that uh, jordan peterson talks about a lot how you need to beautify something in your in your life and you should start with one room and then extend it to the rest of your house and so the first thing that i could think that i could do in my house was call shrek and say hey i need i need some beautification and so i had just published lines of marja and uh i wanted a lion and uh, we're gonna have a picture of a lot of the art, uh, if not all the stuff we can get a hold of, will be on our social media. You guys can scroll through and check it out. But we're going to talk to him today about just, um, you know, same style. We're going to get into your early childhood, early life, and uh, talk about, you know, single or double parent households, uh, siblings growing up, um, and just kind of kick into it from there. But welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time. And, um, you know, I talked to Shrek about this for months before we even did it, you know, when the book was lining up and how could we help more people. And then, you know, using this uh, platform as a conduit for information passing again, for transitioning, for therapy. And, and you know, we're going to kind of talk about that today because it's not just the military service and war that's going to, uh, you know, derive PTSD symptoms or uh or darker thoughts and things and you're you're in a situation where 15 plus years of service fighting fires and helping rescue people and and those things don't always go well and uh i think you mentioned offline a little while ago that prior to 9 11 and prior to going into the war firefighters and and first responders were some of the you know highest yeah, they had some of the highest PTSD rates in America, yeah. and it's been that way for a while. It's uh, it's kind of like a stigma, same as in the military. And uh, you know, some a lot of people don't want to talk about it. It's getting more important now. I mean, they start debriefings. They've done. I mean, there's a lot of things to debrief. There's a lot of there's a charity that I gave to in uh, New Mexico behind the badge, and they do therapy for first responders on a a grand scale. So they try to help them do it for free. So. There's a lot of things out there, but, uh, again, it was kind of a stigma, too, you know, mm -hmm. like we talk about in the military. But mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. You got military guys, firefighters, same kind of thing. You got type A personality guys that are going to come in and, and get after it. And, uh, 
and sometimes they don't know when enough's enough. Sometimes there's that negative stigma in those organizations because you need everybody to be top top of their game, top of their key, and any sign of weakness can be, you know, follow, followed with a negative negative stigma. I know in the Marine Corps, a lot of guys are even afraid to start go, going and getting counseling for PTS, at least in the grunts when I was in, that was the case. Because as soon as you would go get help, your command would already, you know, almost automatically write you off as damaged goods and then you know, you're not getting the same opportunities as you would. So guys would hide that. And, uh, you know, it's a time Afghanistan's done. We've pulled out now. It's time to focus and say, hey, you know, your mental health is extremely important. And uh, and to to neglect yourself and your mental health, you're going to neglect the, the people that are special in your life um, and not give them everything that you could possibly give them. So I hear you on that. I mean, big time. So let's, let's get into it. Let's... Uh, I think right. I think to understand it, we got to go to the beginning, right? So let's I was, start in the beginning. I was born uh, July the nineteenth, nineteen seventy seven, in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. to a single mom. Uh, I've got four siblings. I got an older sister named Rinda. I got a brother named Michael, and I got a little brother named Edric. And so, uh, fond, earliest memories are about five. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Most people, whatever I can remember. Uh, a lot of my memories shot due to being sick, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so... <clears throat> and we'll, we'll talk about that, but when you got yeah. sick later in life, after your, you know, obviously after your your career, you took some injuries, got some infections, and then that started playing hell on your memory and on your on your brain a little bit, so... Well, between that, PTSD, memories, issues, it's trying to... I was practicing what I was going to say for this podcast, you know, how I was going to describe my life, but... Uh, it was, you know, we were pretty poor. Uh, we grew up and my mom was a, a cook. I think her and my father had owned a restaurant at some point in their life. They wasn't married. They were just uh, together. So, mm-hmm. And uh, my mother had shot him in the restaurant. He was he beat her. And so she, she shot him. And, uh, and it killed him? No. Oh. Hit his collarbone and split was- the bullet when each side of his lung. Gave him a little, just gave him a little. Oh, uh, the cops arrested him. Man. Gave him a little act right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that that guy was never around, and I'm kind of thankful for that. But yeah, yeah. supposedly he was very artistic. Like, okay. So that's probably where I get a lot of my art. Well, I get my gift from God, but genetically, I probably got some from him. So. Mm-hmm. But uh, was growing up, uh, poor kid in school, you know, getting picked on, getting bullied, either what they call it, hazed, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you you're like, huge. Yeah, but that not when I was a kid. That yeah, didn't yeah. happen until about the. Uh, <laughs> I think the bullying or the bullying bull- did the, stop. The yes. bullying came to a screeching halt it at, at growth spurt number one. <laughs> about the seventh or eighth grade. How tall were you then? About the same height. So you were huge. Yeah, uh, when I, I mean, graduated, com- compared to everybody else. Yeah, when I graduated high school, my fighting weight was well, I'm right at six four, and I was two eighty. <laughs> Yeah, no bullying there. No, no but I, I, was, I was talking about that. But I was—I'm pretty—I'm not a conflict-oriented dude. You know that. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty laid back. And uh, growing up, I always thought that uh, I could beat people with my mind, mm-hmm. being more intelligent than they are, getting mm-hmm. out of stuff. And so there was fights, but uh, there wasn't many. Mm-hmm. And usually I won them. So, <laughs> but there were some I didn't win. But you know, as kids, you fight as kids, man. Yeah. I had a neighbor. And uh, we would get in dirt clod fights, man. We'd make these square <laughs> dirt clods, and just we'd get, get on top of the house and just ping each other with them. <laughs> like, my brother-in-law, uh, I met him when I was around five. He dated my sister, and his name is Wally. And he used to work on cars. He's a mechanic. That's what he did. And yeah. he lived with us for a while, a long time. And then, But he'd have, like, transmissions and stuff out there. We'd get dipsticks and just have sword fights. I mean, we just did mean <laughs> stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. To each other. And to each other. Who you liked? No, not really. This kid was okay. kind of a bully. Okay. You know, we lived like three houses, and I lived in the middle. I had a good friend, Richard. Uh, he was Hispanic. He lived on the right side of me, and then this other dude was just, just a an terror. Asshole. Yeah, him and his little brother, me. Mm-hmm. Like uh, a kid from probably uh, Christmas Story, that kind of mean. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you had to fight back. You had to do what you had to do. But, uh, you know earliest memories with my mom she used to take us fishing all the time mm. and so that was a big part of my life it still is a big part of my life fishing mm-hmm. and so 
just grew up. Uh, she worked at a cafe, you know, cooking, and she was a hell of a cook. And then around Christmas and stuff, she would uh, bake pies and stuff like that and mm. sell them. And back then, even then, it was like $15 for a pie. I mean, these chocolate and coconut cream pies, man, they were, yeah, people would come around for all over and buy these pies. Nice. And she would make, that's how she made our Christmas money. Mm. And Making then, things happen. Yeah. She was a good lady. She, uh, and then uh, around the age of nine, she started coming sick. And she started having surgeries. And uh, she had 31 of them and, before she passed away. Yeah. And what kind of sick? Uh, she had just a lot of physical health, mm -hmm. you know, with her knees. And so she was in a wheelchair a lot of times. And so go into that. What degenerative arthritis? Is yeah, that what it was? Yeah, degenerative arthritis. So, okay. you know, she was... 31 surgeries on her knees. Yeah, this is back. In one leg, she didn't have a knee. They finally just cut just cut her knee out and just fused the femur and tib them together. Mm. So she's about three inches shorter on her left leg. So I'll tell a funny story. She's a peg leg on the left. So <laughs> me and my little brother used to jump on the back of a wheelchair and ride them down hills. And we'd jump off and, you know, slow her down. And I was getting the car unlocked, open into the trunk. And my little brother's pushing her. And at the end of our runway, at the end of the uh, sidewalk was a T. And then it was just a clit, you know, like a little slant off the dirt, off the sidewalk. Well, he didn't jump off, and her peg leg came off. And they went off the end of the sidewalk. Her leg was like a catapult. Oh, no. <laughs> and they were going over. And then she grabbed my little brother and was beating his ass before they hit the ground. <laughs> and I was over the car laughing. Man. And she like, come over here. So I whoop your ass. Too. I was like, no, it's not going to happen. So. I'm going to stay over here. <laughs> I'm going to stay over here until you're not being done being mad. You can't catch me if I stay over here. <laughs> That's a funny thing. We used to let her beat, I mean, spank us. You know what I mean? We'd have to go over there and, and, uh, you say let her. <laughs> well, or she'd call my brother in law and he'd just show up and whoop our asses and be gone. <laughs> You'd rather have her do it? Yeah, I'd rather have her do it. But, uh, you know, like, we used to have to go get stuff to spank us with, you know what I mean? Again, my little brother wasn't the smartest. <laughs> he brought a stick one time. She started laughing. She wears ass out with it? No, but oh. she did with the clothes hanger. So <laughs> he should have probably picked what he wanted to bring her. But Metal or plastic? That was a metal one. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah. Oof. He didn't do that again. Yeah, I bet he didn't. Yeah, we... Uh, that takes one time. Yeah, we... Uh, so when she started getting sick, we started, she spent a lot of time in the hospital. So we spent a lot of time with my sister and my brother-in-law. And you're nine when she starts getting sick-ish. Eight, eight, nine, she starts having all these surgeries and they're just, they're just compounded. And they're just one after another and they're just trying to keep her from, she winds up getting an infection later on, like mm -hmm. I had. And that's what really causes her to pass away. But yeah, she was just struggling. And then. And so you have to grow up kind of quick at nine years old, I'm assuming. Yeah, my sister and my brother-in-law helped a lot. I'm not, but there's a lot we had to do, like cooking, cleaning, mm. uh, emptying her, her bedside body. You know, whatever you had to do to get to get you know you take care of her. And mm. you know, it was it was different. But I wasn't. I was, and I think about it. And I t I talked to my therapist, and she'll be proud of me. But that made me angry at the world. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't really angry at other people, but I was just angry at what how life was treating her, mm -hmm. how it wasn't fair. You know what I mean? Yeah. It didn't seem fair. Yeah. And so I was mad. Yeah. From a, from an early, yes, yeah, early was, point in your life, you were disgruntled at the world. Yeah. I was just mad yeah. and, and it leads on, it, it gets worse. And then, uh, but you know, my childhood, I, it was good. I mean, my mother supported us. She took us to sports. She did everything. Mm. A lot of the schools. What sports did you play? Uh, baseball was my love. Football, I excelled at. Mm. I was yeah, pretty good size. So I did well in both of them. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, played basketball in my senior year, but it was just to foul people, man. It was just going there. <laughs> That's all I got to do. Just go in there and wreck shop. Dennis Rodman. Uh, well, I, he jumped a lot higher than I do, but <laughs> uh, yeah, just go foul. And that, that was what it was. You know, we'd get out of football season, and, we'd, and I got a good friend. His name is Preston, and he married my, my best friend, Tandy. And then I, we played ball against each other, and it was – he said he hated it. That was the first game we played mm -hmm. was after us getting out of football, and they didn't play football. We're small towns in Oklahoma, you know. Mm -hmm. 
And so we would just beat the piss out of them because of the contact. You know, they it was a physical, and they didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. So baseball, football, a little basketball at the end. Lifted weights. And you, and you graduated what year? 95. 95. So we're still pre-9-11. And but we're not pre-Oklahoma City bombing, and I'll talk about that. Yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, but let's let's get to yeah absolutely let's get to where we were. Uh, so my mom would take us fishing uh, a lot at night, and we would donate a lot of the fish to give to other families that were poor. But we did stupid stuff, and that was that was the, what we did. I mean, that was you guys' thing. We didn't have a lot of money, so I mean, it took her a while to get because she couldn't work eventually, and she was on finally got Social Security. It took a while. Mm. I mean, that process is not simple. And, you know, they denied her a couple of times. And then she mm-hmm. finally she finally got it. So we were living off fixed income, you know. Yeah. So food stamps, uh, stand in line for government rations, stand in line for Native American rations. And so, you know, government cheese, stuff like that. I mean, that's yeah. what I grew up on, stuff in white boxes. and But I don't eat hamburger helper anymore. Just had a lot of that. Yeah, I had hamburger helper and ramen in the barracks for several years of my life. <laughs> yeah, you know what I guess. So. Yeah, but uh, you know, and uh, we move around a couple of times. You know what I mean? Around closer to my sister, really. And you're in Oklahoma, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is a this is a Hollis and Gould in the time frame of my grade school years this is what kind of what we're talking about when my mom starts getting sick and Mm -hmm. we moved to uh, Hollis Oklahoma to be right closer to my sister and so my sister had some kids my nephews and my mother would watch them she was trying to go to school you know and uh, she didn't very well she was working to be a veterinarian and it just got to the point where she couldn't do it no more you know Mm -hmm. what I mean Mm -hmm. so being around mom and mom would help watch Benjamin and Britton and, and my little, little niece Shelby and uh, that's how we grew up you know what I mean mm. it was a small little family in, in Oklahoma man. so and so let's move let's move past that so that's middle school starting high school years yeah sports. we move uh, we're living in Hollis we got these uh, couple friends that are helping take care of my mom she's worse off you know like more bedridden mm-hmm. than she is normally, you know, hard to get around. And uh, they got we got these uh, people that would come in because she was low income, so they would help do nursing care, like help clean the house, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Her name was Cindy, and her husband's name was George. He was legally blind, and they were good people. And so when they moved to Sarah, we followed them up there, Sarah, Oklahoma. And I was away from my sister, so we were. I was older then, so. I'm in like the ninth grade, eighth grade, I think is about this time. And, uh, you know, it's a good school, man. The school takes care of us. The church takes care of us. That's a big thing. We was in church all the time. Mom took care of mom made sure. What denomination? Church. Baptist. Baptist. Southern Baptist. Yep, yep. Uh, or First Baptist, whatever you want to call it. But she always made sure we was in church, and that was important. And, uh, you know, that was important for us, man. Mm-hmm. That, you know, that lifeline and mm-hmm. the people. And it... It becomes more of a lifeline here shortly, but uh, so mom being mom being mom, you know what I mean. In the situation, the school decided that they would allow me to go to Votech in the ninth grade instead of my junior year, so I could mm-hmm. get four years. I was working for uh, one of the deacons that took care of me. This is when we're in Sayre. And, and you're so, what ninth, tenth grade? Uh, yeah, ninth grade. So fourteen, fifteen. I start working in a printing press. Mm-hmm. I got a good drink for a second. I'm sorry. So I'm working for this dude named Brad. He's the deacon of our church, and that's who I stay with when my mom's in the hospital for like 30 days or whatever, 45 days. Surgeries and stuff, yeah. Yeah, she's laid up. So I would stay with Brad and Dana, Mm -hmm. and I would work at their print shop. They Mm -hmm. run the printing press and made the made the papers and then they would print business cards and stuff mm-hmm, like that they mm-hmm. do stuff like that so mm-hmm. i worked for them i started doing that and so then i started going to votech for graphic arts and we hadn't really talked about the art but since i was a kid i was artistic since mm-hmm. the age of five and then you know as i grew up it just got more advanced and more 
the more I practiced, the better did I got. Did you just practice on your own, or did you get any kind of formal art education at this point? Uh, not till junior high. Okay. You know, I mean, I get into an art school, and that's in Sarah. And that was really what blows up my art. Like, okay. I was always kind of drawing stuff, and I was good at it. And I mimic stuff is what I really do. Is Especially at that age, I would look at something and copy it or draw mm-hmm. it. And that, I try to get it close, you know, comparison. And then I would do that over and over on a lot of things. But it was also a therapy relief for me mm. at a Explain young age. Explain that. Well... Art therapy in general is uh, it's very positive for people with PTSD, trauma, anxiety, depression. And I think, you know, my mom being sick, I was depressed a lot as a kid mm. and angry. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's sad. You see her suffer and then there's no And you can't do, do anything about it. can't do anything about it, but help her. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. Help her the best you can. And I mean, you want her to do, you want her to do, be able to do things with you, but that's not always the way it goes. And so... You know, I didn't really have, I'd have a few friends, but it's not like I was, I wasn't, I wasn't the kid that got picked on all the time and I wasn't the popular kid. I was somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. I could get along with everybody Mm -hmm. and I did. And so, yeah, um, I start Votech and playing sports. The school allows me to do work at the school to pay for my uniforms and cleats and stuff like that. And the church helps, you know, with that. Mm -hmm. I was pretty athletic. Mm -hmm. It was pretty good. So, uh, you know, I get ready to go to Votech one morning, and I called out for my mom, and she didn't answer. And I knew, like that, mm-hmm. what was wrong. And I went in there, and I checked on her, and she had done passed away, you know. Mm-hmm. So, I think the hardest part was about that was uh, calling 911, I remember. And, or, or the hospital or something. I, it was a small town. So it wasn't, I think I called the police department. They're mm-hmm. like, hey, you got to call the hospital. Mm-hmm. You know, they couldn't help me. And then, so I did that. Called the police department. They sent somebody. We, My sister lived four or five hours away. Mm-hmm. And my, my aunt and my grandma were a couple hours away. So we were just, me and my little brother was just stranded there. Mm-hmm. For hours and you're in ninth grade yeah mm-hmm. and so uh, I don't talk about it much so but yeah that was uh, that, those three days I mean it was a, and I, I say three days I'll tell you it was, it was a whirl yeah, she died they came and got her took her to a funeral home people in the church helped pay you know she had a little bit of a life insurance wasn't much. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was not like we got rich. It was enough to barely cover the funeral. And, uh, then we still had to drive her from Sarah, Oklahoma to our Indian burial land, which is in eastern Oklahoma. We have a couple of acres that was given to us mm-hmm. back when they were divvying out land, and that's where our burial, and that's where she's buried. And so they still had to drive her out there, and that cost money too, you know, when yeah. transport. And yeah. it was just wild. But like I said, the people of the church, man, the people of Sarah, Oklahoma, and the First Baptist Church of Sarah, I can't say enough for them. You know, they bought us a bunch of clothes, gave us money, and then we didn't, we were orphans. Mm-hmm. So, shit, man, we were, you know, our sister, you know, there was a conflict with my aunt, my grandma, I believe, about they wanted me to stay there and continue to go to school and work and get, you know, like graphic arts, you know, I was doing well in it. and. Mm-hmm. You know, and then on the other hand, my sister's like, no, they're living with us. That's not going to, you're not going to live with a deacon of the church. Yeah. That's what we're going to have to do is if I was to stay, I'd have to live with a deacon. Mm -hmm. And then, but that wasn't the option. So I went to live with my sister and within, so in three days, you know, I'm leaving all my best friends, people that were at the funeral with me, people from the church and I'm in a new town and Mm -hmm. I made up in my mind I was going to be whoever the hell I wanted to be at that point. Mm-hmm. I was pissed off. So I came into that town with a vengeance, brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was mm-hmm. like, no, I'm not. And it was really, it wasn't fair to my sister or my brother-in-law, but I was mad as fuck. Mm-hmm. I was really mad. Yeah, I couldn't take that shit out. So, you know, other than football. So I got there and 
was first day of practice, man, and I had to put this dude on his ass because I, you know, it's either that or you're gonna. You, what are you gonna do? Yeah. You know, you gotta yeah. show them that you're there to play. And yeah. This is a small town, and you know, good people, and there's some of this. And that town is the best town I've ever lived. And that's in Allen, Oklahoma. That's what I call home. And that's where you moved right. with your sister. Yeah, that's where okay. I moved with my sister, and so we get in there and. Me and my little brother moved with my sister, and they already have three kids, and it's a small house, and money's short. You know, my brother-in-law's busting his ass, and we're going to school. I'm playing sports. I start working at McDonald's and do well at that. You know I mean? I mm. get, get up in the morning, go to school. I'd work on the homework usually first thing in the morning. Go to school, go to practice, go to work. And that's what I did, man. And it, mm. I think that really helped me. Build a routine. Well, it was structure one, and... It allowed me to get out of the way from my mind because mm-hmm. I was mad, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit, like how just chasing chasing something to yeah. keep from dealing with your own problems. Yeah. Idle time is the devil's playground. Yeah. So my mind has been very active all my life, and and it gets, it gets more active over time. It just won't shut off, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we moved to Allen, and, you know. Now, did you get into a... Did you get into a uh, vocational or art? Yeah, it, you know, in, place in, in the in the new place. Ah, uh, no, they're, they're, they were doing drafting. Okay. So I tried it for like a semester. I couldn't get into it. drawing. I mean, Sarah. I didn't talk about it, but Sarah had a great art program, and there was a good friend I had there named Mark White Skunk. He was a Native American kid. Shout out, Mark. Yeah, shout out, Mark. Awesome artist. Like this kind of art and we would push each other so uh, he would do something I would do something and we made it a game mm-hmm. but it also increased our you're practicing you're training practicing, yeah training and, mm-hmm. and hours and hours of doing this and so and we would have art contests and stuff so when I moved to Allen they didn't have an art program and they didn't have graphic arts they only had drafting so but and when it came around one being Native American and then two when it came around scholastically, when they would have scholastic meets, I would compete for the school mm-hmm. on the art as an art. Like we didn't have art, but I would compete scholastically, and so I won every time I went. And there would be like drawing live models, and you'd have your portfolio. You'd bring in what stuff you'd already drawn, a lot of things that I really don't have up anymore. But a lot of them got tore up and mm-hmm. paper drawings and stuff like that over the years. But you know, you would give your portfolio, and then you would draw, like, a live model. You'd have, like, 50 minutes, and then you'd draw that sketch, and then they would grade you. And then they would hand out, like, medals. Mm-hmm. And the school would compete, you know. I don't know if you've ever won any, like, a debate team or anything. I was on a debate team in high school. But, yeah, I did. So I understand the process, but never in Big part. surprise on that one. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that's why I brought it up. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> But uh, so didn't have that art program, but I did. I did compete now and scholastically, and then you know that's really what I kind of wanted to do. I wanted to work for Disney. Okay. Really, that was kind of the like dream. Like drawing for them. Yeah, doing animation. Mm-hmm. And that's really like what's your dream? I was like, I work for Disney. You know, I thought that was going to be cool, but I started. Dating. I'm not sure you could show kids all of your art. Not now. Not now. <laughs> Probably not then neither. To be honest with you, yeah. I do some dark stuff. I mean, I yeah. expressed. We talk about it. I mean, art, you can express so many things. You can get feelings out. You can, you know, depends on your mood. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, and you can talk about that at way better lengths than I can. But when you're putting passion into something, if that passion is not light passion, it can be the opposite of that, which can be dark passion, which can be just as much therapeutic, uh, therapeutical as, as drawing something uh it's like you got a koi up there behind you, you got some animation behind you, and then you got the demon baby behind you. Yeah. Right. So there's therapy in drawing all of that, depending on what, where the emotions are. I'm assuming, right, and where that headspace is. Uh, yeah. So the process of usually what I do is depends on how I'm feeling that day, kind of what I'm working on. Uh, a lot of heavy metal music. Mm. I mean, I put music on. I listen to music. That's just as therapeutic as my art. Mm. Uh, I listen to music constantly. And uh, have headphones, and a lot of time I just put the music on, and then I go to work. Just go to that place. I go to that place, and sometimes I'm not in it. I make myself do it. I try to do it every day mm-hmm. for the therapy of it. Mm-hmm. 
and for cognitive skills, working on my hand movements because my hands do shake now. And mm-hmm. They're getting worse. And, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell that through your art, man. Well, I used to shake too when I would start IVs and stuff like that. My hands shake, and then people people would be freaking out, and then <laughs> I'll be all right. lock into the zone. Uh, lock in. Well, and, and when I start painting, it stops because mm-hmm. you're focusing really on what you're doing, and you're not thinking about your hands shaking. You're thinking mm-hmm. about I want this color to look like this, or I want mm-hmm. this shadow or this this depth. Or I think that I get a little bit of that out of writing too. I try to write every day, and it doesn't always happen, but it's good practice. It does cognitively, uh, therapeutically, something that has helped me. And uh, so I can, I, I guess I could relate to that side of it. Maybe writing being a form of art, it but, is, but like I can't draw a stick figure with a good face. You know what I mean? So different strokes for different folks. But for me, it's uh, the writing. For you, it's the art. For Matt, it's mechanics. You know, everybody's got their niche. And uh, when you find that, you can really use that to your advantage to get yourself through some, through some spots, through some dark spots. You can, and it, and I had this that nobody had access to it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I have this. It's kind of like a little power thing I have. Nobody's taking it from you. No, you, you yeah. can't, right. right? But I also have it when I'm in times of need. If I was by myself, I could do it. It's self-soothing. Mm-hmm. You don't need anybody's help. I don't need anybody's help, yeah. and I can do it. And 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 you could just about draw anywhere yes i mean there's all yeah, yeah. people do plain air painting and they're outside and they'll show up and they'll paint something and they'll move on mm. and they'll use oils or mostly oils but you know they'll paint and move on gotcha some sure. acrylics i'm sure they use acrylics too but check well okay so kind of kind of sidetracked there getting into painting but let's well, finish yeah so i'm in sayre i mean i'm in allen oklahoma my mother had passed away I start dating this girl, and I'm pretty serious over her. I mean, I'm not going to name her name, but she knows who she is. Shout out. Shout out. But it, and I was really, I mean, that was the family that I was kind of, I was hung around them a lot. So mm-hmm. I played football with her brother. He was a hell of an athlete, dude. And, uh, you know, and it was, I wanted to marry her, you know, mm. and like, I, I, I loved it. So. Mm-hmm. And now I was look probably, probably looking for love, you know, some comfort, companionship. Yeah, somebody to person. love me, mm-hmm. to feel like they love me. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. I didn't feel loved at that time. You, and you know? just felt like the world was shitting all over you. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but this is what changes my life. And I'm at her house one evening, and her dad's a volunteer fire chief. He's like, "I need you to go with me, man. There's a car fire." I'm sure somebody stole it and burned it or whatever. Sure. It's out in the middle of the road in the middle of the night in BFE. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so we go out there and I help him do that, man. I'm just hooked, bro. Line and sinker. Like, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And uh, after that, man, I wasn't working for Disney no more, you know? Mm-hmm. You know? I found your niche. I found my niche, but getting there was a different that was the hard part so i graduate high school i make all state in football uh, we go to state finals in baseball i mean we go to state corner finals in football i mean we were really getting gifted. after it yeah we were really gifted that year and for a small town you and know, this is what's the high school called allen oklahoma allen, allen oklahoma high school. High school? yeah allen high school. Okay. Okay. okay yeah uh 26 people in my graduating class get some you know, I thought I had a small one. I was like 90-something at my... No, there was 1,200 people in the town. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so everybody... Out West it. is a bit different. Yeah. I remember one time going out West elk hunting, and we came into like uh, the trailhead that we would go up to elk hunt in Wyoming, and like it had the population sign. It was like 899. It was scratched off 896. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> scratched it off because they had a death or whatever, a couple deaths. I was like, oh, my God. And it's like a big swath of land for, yeah. for only 900 people, right? So... Uh, yeah, it's wild. It's a different place out there. Well, I mean, that's just it's small town living. I mean, yep. you know, there's a lot of farming out there. There's a lot of Tyson is big out there. They have a lot of hog farms, and and that's you know, if you're not working for Tyson, you know, it's really there's not much there unless you're you know, as far as industry and other opportunity. Yeah, there's right. not much in the town. There's like maybe one stop left in the town. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it, I think it flashes all four, and I can't remember. It's been a while since I've been back home. But check. 
So uh, hadn't got much better. So fire chief get, right. gets you hooked. Well, I get hooked, and I'm, I, th- I keep thinking about that. I graduate high school, you know, still dating the same girl, trying to go to college. I was Wyoming and Tulsa and a few other teams trying to recruit me and for what sport? Football. Okay. And I just really didn't want to play, man, because you can't work and uh, play sports co- co- collegially. If if you don't have a full ride, man, it's hard. That's yeah. right. Even the ones that get a full ride sometimes can't work just yeah, because I looked of their at situation. It. Yeah. And it's just like these guys are. Yeah, I, I walked on to East so Central. So talented, but it yeah. makes a, a big roadblock. Yeah, I walked on to East Central, did all my NCA paperwork, attended a couple of practices, and it was like, and find out, you know, you're there at 4 o'clock in the morning lifting weights. You go to school, and then you're there from like 2 to 3 to 8 at night. And. I was working a couple of jobs, living on my own. You know, mm-hmm. I, I moved. I moved out as soon as I could. As soon as I graduated, I did, nothing against my sister, but and my brother-in-law, but I just didn't feel like I wanted to be told what to do anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and I was still pissed. So I was pissed at life. You know, mm-hmm. and so you know, I'm trying to struggle in this and figure all this out. Not, you know, I want to go looking at maybe. You know, like I want to go to Oklahoma City Fire Department. They're the biggest fire department there. And, and I was like thinking about that. And, you know, I've always wanted to be in the military. I was a military junkie, played soldier as a kid, did all that stuff. You know what I mean? So that was an option. And, you know, things go on and I'm just clicking along. And uh, the, beer, uh, the Chickasaw Nation start, starts up a forestry crew. Yeah, what's what is that? Uh, well, the forestry crew. No, no, I mean the, the Chickasaw Nation. Yeah, yeah. That's the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma. I'm Choctaw. Okay. The Chickasaw and headquarters in in eight Oklahoma, and they were starting up a forestry crew. He was like 15 guys. He's usually what you're traveling with, and you go out and fight wildfires. Mm-hmm. So you go through the training. You get trained by the uh, NWCG National Wildlife uh, Coordination Group, I believe is what it is, if I can remember right. Mm-hmm. And the forestry, you get trained by the forestry is what it comes down to. You do their week-long class. It's a lot. You got to do a PT test. And I think now it's a three-mile walk within so many minutes. You got to, you know, carry so much weight, mm-hmm. like a weighted vest. And sure. You got to do certain things. It used to be a box test when I first started. But you, anyway, you pass it. And so I was like, I'm going to get in this firefighting. You know, I'm going to do this. So I pass. I do all right and go through the training and then. It's not long after we're done with the training, we get called out to find a missing child mm-hmm. at a lake. A little two-year-old was missing. Uh, it had been like 12, 14 hours. So we had pagers at the time. I had a pager. And I got I got paged. And so I went to my girlfriend's house, called them. And they're like, hey, we're going to go out there for this kid. You need to be here as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. And it was an hour drive. So I hauled ass, got there. And we went out. and We had some really good trackers. All, all, most everybody's Native American, so there was really a couple of good trackers, and we found that child laying by a pond, and you know, dehydrated, sick, kind of in and out of it, but they landed a chopper. So that was the first thing we did as a crew. We saving did, lives. Saving lives, really. And I was 18, mm-hmm. 17, 18, and so that was just like, oh, hell yeah, that's so, huge, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So that was like, I, I, yeah, I was definitely sold on it then, you know, and so. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm in college, trying to go to college, not playing, you know, figure, I can't play football. This is not going to work this way. So I was like, man, what am I going to do? So uh, we got, I was in the middle of a semester, maybe my second semester, and we got called out for to go to Oregon, fight some wildfires in there. And so uh, we, we assembled the crew, and uh, they drove us to Little Rock from uh, Ada. We got on a big plane. They flew us out to Oregon, Redmond, Redmond, Oregon. We got there, and then we got bust out to our bust out to our first fire. And it was not. It was in the lower. It was in the end stage of it. They had it under control. It was mm-hmm. pretty doing just mop up, going through putting out a lot of the stuff. Pocket and, fires. And pocket fires. Like stuff. You know, root balls, stuff like that. A lot of the big heavy timber, whatever they're going to do. They're cutting trees, dropping old trees. You're just kind of doing whatever, digging the line. Mm-hmm. But the fire was really contained. And we did about, a, I don't know, three or four days there. And then we got pushed to a big fire, Strawberry Mountain. And that's 
that painting up there. Mm-hmm. And we'll, it, we'll get uh, pictures of all these paintings put up yeah. for for you guys on the Choices Not Chances Facebook page. If you want to see any of Robert's uh, paintings? They're phenomenal. Please visit the page and uh, and drop a like, drop a comment, let them know what you think. Yeah. So yeah. we get out there, we get to Strawberry Mountain, and it's a big operation. There's probably three or four thousand firefighters there, and they've got these two semis set up that are cooking stations and they're like restaurants man they're serving food and you eat very well <laughs> i mean they i don't know what they cost but it's worth every damn dime i tell you that <laughs> i mean you burn probably eight or nine thousand calories right. a day i yeah. bet and so and the only really hot meal you're getting is at night and mm-hmm. some in the breakfast you know and then you carry your lunch in wherever you're going right and so whatever you take with us is all you got until you get back from the line and so we started fighting fire and you know, there's one day that we go up there and it takes us three or four hours and a deuce and a half to get up to the mountain. Mm. And then we're walking in another three or four. And, it, and then when we first got there, it was horrible. Because we come pretty pretty flat land and the altitude <laughs> changed. And then climbing at a great, like, there's Oxygen times where you would, you would look right at the side of the cliff. You're, yep. And people are dropping tools. and But, you know, the guys that work there, they're like billy goats, man. You know, Straight up. The dude, he's taking crews up two or three times a day, you know, taking crews up, taking crews down. And this guy's just like, we're taking like 10 steps. We're like, ah, you know. I'm burning. Oh, it's horrible. My thighs are burning. It's horrible. You yeah, know, sure. Lungs and it's, are burning. And it's, an 18, it's going to be an 18 hour day. And you want to work more hours because that's how you get paid. You get paid hourly yeah. when you're doing that. Yeah. So at that time, they would let you work like 18. They don't now. They do a eight hour work, sixteen hour, or sixteen and then eight on or something like that. So right. they changed it, but uh yeah, it was a blast. Uh we would do that and going up that mountain and I watched half a mountain burn in one day, man. You know, and Intense. it's it, yeah. And so you gotta think some of these trees are a hundred foot tall. If they're fully involved then the flame is a hundred and 40 feet tall and there's really not much stopping that one unless you're doing airdrops back burning clearing lines you know trying to get that fire to stop and them guys are heroes man yeah they do a lot of hard work and that was it's probably the funnest thing i've ever done in firefighting but that was three weeks we spent there and it was uh man it was a life changer so 18 years old i've done that i come back and i'm like man let's that's this what I'm doing. Yeah. So I got to figure out something. So I went for a Tyson interview, and it was to wash out trucks, man. Can, like, can you explain what Tyson is? Tyson Foods. Okay. Tyson yeah. Chicken. Okay. Ty- yeah, okay. Tyson. I, did, yeah. I wasn't sure. Okay. Yeah, so they have hog farms, pig farms. They yeah. raise all their stuff, and then okay. they slaughter it. So. Check. The, so the semi-trailer, semi-trucks come in, carry it out. They hose everything out. You start on the bottom and work your way up. And I have mm. some friends that are management. You know, they're moving up, and that's what they did out of high school. So. I was like, man, if I can get on Tyson, you know, I got the end. It's a couple of these farms, you know what I mean? Because I got buddies working there. And so I went for that interview, and, and I was stopped. I stopped to grab some lunch or something at a little place called Taco Mile. It's like a Oklahoma version of Taco Bell. Okay. <laughs> but uh, there was an Army recruiter in there, and I saw him, and I was like, I went up to him. I was like, hey, you ever put anybody in the Army as a firefighter? And he's like, no, but we'll try. And so I've been out of high school for two years at this point. Mm. And so he's like, you, got, you know, when when did you take the ASVAB? I was like this, you know. I said, I didn't try on it. I didn't care about it. And I said, but I'm willing to retake it and do whatever we got to do. So he's like, yeah, let's try it. Let's see what we can do. So, you know, he's like, well, you got to lose some weight. I was like 280 at the time. I was like, all right. So I started running. I got down to like 260. Mm-hmm. And we go up to MAPS and... You know, you're doing all whatever you do at maps. You know, what I mean the whole process, and you know, walking like a duck, getting screened. Mm-hmm. And uh, they go up there and they ask, you know, like you get pick three things you want to be. So first one was firefighter, second one was medic, and third one was MP. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do something in, in emergency line. services. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if I didn't get that, that's what I was going to choose in the military. So I went up there and. They're like, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a firefighter. So they looked it up, you know, fire control, fire ground, whatever, you know, the firefighter. And they had one slot. And I said, I'll take it. A month later, man, I was shipping, shipping out to Fort Leonard Wood. So 
it was a quick transition and you know and i joined the, I, I checked with the air force and they're like you got to retake your ASVAB. i was like I, I, I know that but they wouldn't guarantee the fire school mm-hmm. and the army would that's why i went to the army but right. bet they, they promised me as long as i passed basic training i can go to the fire cabin yep and that right there is a big that's a lot of money yeah that they're investing in yeah well, you also still had some experience in firefighting too, so I mean, yeah, it that made it a sense. little easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, although know, I'm sure when you go to the army, they, they, they're not taking your yeah. word that you fought any well, kind of fire. Right, but yeah, they don't care. Yeah, yeah, you're still going to go yeah. do all the fun stuff. You're going to do everything they want you to. So, <laughs> you know, uh, how did it go being disgruntled in boot camp? Because it may have been a break with the structure i know for it was a, it was a lot of the structure and it was good mm-hmm. for me and here's the thing my my brother had been in the national guard uh, the girl's dad i was dating he'd been in the military so mm-hmm. I, I knew what to expect mm-hmm. just shut up and do what you're told mm-hmm. and that's all you have to do really mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and give it all you got mm-hmm. you'll do fine that's right and so mm-hmm. i went in there that you know went in there like that you know it was a shock you know the first week you're in process and map, uh, or you know the maps part of, like we was at Fort Leonard Wood and going getting the shots, going getting our gear. Oh yeah, being issued everything, you know, doing the whole week long, and then we got picked up on cycle. You know, the fun starts. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Yeah, what? Well, yeah, you know, shakedowns, yelling, screaming. You know, it, I, I, it's comical. <laughs> I was gonna. That's why I was asking because it's like. <laughs> Like, I knew what they were doing. Yeah, well, you had an idea, but you've already, from the age of nine years old, lived a pretty rough. I'm not going to say rough, because you had a good... You had a, you had a good... But you had some adversity at ages that most, I would say... I want to say most, but several, yeah. I would say the masses don't deal with the things you dealt with at nine years old all the way to 16, 17. So you come in here, and maybe some of these kids are freaking out because they've never dealt with adversity in your life, but you're like, okay... Yeah, I, yeah. I, it was like, so yeah. me and this other guy got called in drill sergeant's office, like, first day. And he's like, yeah, you're going to be the guy on marriage. I'm like, that's what you, one, you're tall, and this is what you're going to do. And we want you to, you know. And we can't pick on you. <laughs> they, they picked on me. But, yeah, but, uh, yeah and, and so basic training started, man. And it was, you know, getting up, running, Doing the stuff you're going to do, training, whatever, rifle range, whatever you're doing for that day. And then, you know, you have a little bit of time in the evening. No, not much drawing went on. Not much art went on during this time period. Sure. You know, that kind of, my art kind of just dropped off for a little while off the radar. I mean, I would do certain things later, but no. Not, you were busy. I, I had stuff to do. Mm-hmm. I was working on, focusing on getting through basic training and been doing what I needed to do and getting to the fire academy. So, get through basic um, we get, and then I go and then I go to Lewis F. Garland Fire Academy, which is in Goodfellow. So that's where I'm doing my uh, AIT training. Okay. So I leave leave, leave Fort Leonard Wood, go there. We start. No, we don't start immediately. We get there we're in a couple of weeks because it's a four month long school for the most part. Mm-hmm. That's like if you don't mess anything up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it was like two or three weeks before we got picked up on our cycle. And so I started the fire academy, and you. You do everything that you're going to do in any other fire academy. You know what I mean? It's climbing, you know, it's hauling hose, it's doing search and rescue, it's, you know, learning about hazmat, learning sure. about EMS, learning about structural firefighting, crash fire rescue, uh, I mean, you know, rope rescue, repelling. I mean, it, you know. Anything you need to know for fires. And things you don't need. I mean, and, <laughs> and, and other things. And well. other things that you don't know you're going to need yet. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a good initial, but it's not anywhere where you're going to learn in your life because you spend the rest of your life in school. Mm-hmm. If you really want it, it's like anything. If you really want to excel at it, you do. And it's an ever changing job. Mm-hmm. EMS changes every day, firefighting changes every day. There's you're never going to have a fire that burns the same, I would assume. No, you have similar, but yeah. like, you know, that was like that, but it wasn't like this. And, there's a lot of factors going into it. And mm-hmm. So I go through the fire academy and I wind up, I find out I'm getting orders back to Fort Leonard Wood and I thought I was going to get away from that place, you know. <laughs> so I get back. Is this when you take orders to the 562nd? Yeah. 5th Engineer Battalion? So I get attached to them. So there's, at the time there was, 
I think, four deployable fire departments. Okay. And there's eight people that deploy. So your unit's eight people. And we roll out with a fire truck, a tanker, and a Humvee, and that's how we deploy. And we did crash fire rescue on Army bases mm-hmm. and structural firefighting. Mm-hmm. So we do both. Marine Corps does crash fire rescue. That's like Lejeune does all that same stuff for their base? or The civilians do most of all the structure. But the fire station there has marine firefighters or no cherry point does cherry point okay for crash fire rescue yes sir okay gotcha yeah. gotcha some bases do some bases don't so now you're on Leonard Wood Leonard Wood 562nd and you're fighting unit. fires both structural and crash fire rescue with an eight man team well I'll tell you how it works so okay. like we have a when I initially get there we have a uh, military fire station that we're assigned to we have our truck we work with the civilians we work alongside with them so sure Unless it's a range, NBC training, PT test, I'm not at the company. Mm-hmm. I'm at the firehouse doing mm-hmm. 24s. Mm-hmm. That's that's how we live. The, really, the civilians' jobs are to help us train for deployments, as in firefighting wise, and then sure. then we do our other training with the company for the rest of the deployment. You know, mm-hmm. soldier side of stuff. So mm-hmm. that's how it would roll down, and that's how we got. So I get there, we're doing this. So I'm new to the company, you know, but. I've already got the fire academy. I've already got uh, got stuff going on in there. I hang on, let me get got the fire academy done. You get there, and I start becoming the primary driver for the, the crash truck. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, do our thing and uh, start EMT school. You know, right when I get there. And is that is that like a mandatory thing that you guys are doing that? Like for the army, or is this one of the things? Is this something that maybe you went after volunteered for? It's, they asked. I think nearly all of us went through it. Mm-hmm. But uh, for most jobs, yeah, you got to be at least an EMT mm-hmm. and preferred paramedic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what's the difference between those two? Scope of skills. Paramedics more advanced. Yeah, carrying drugs, doing a lot of different things, a lot of different procedures. Mm-hmm. EMTs still do a lot. They do. You can't have a good paramedic without a good EMT. You know what I mean? They're they're your partner, and mm-hmm. a lot of times you maybe have double medics, and so you know it changes how you work the call. Mm-hmm. But because yeah. of your resources, capabilities. Yeah, what what it depends on what you're doing, man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're trying to intubate a patient, you know it's nice to have extra help there when they can do it too, because you don't get them all you know, on the first try, and sometimes you got to do it the second try. It depends on their airway when there's blood. Sure. In it. You know, it's it's. So EMT school, and you go to paramedic school too? I, I do later, but later, okay. EMT. And so I finish up the EMT school, and it's almost December of 97, and we get orders to go to Haiti. So man, I've been, I got there. I graduated in August. I got to Fort Leonard in August of 97, and we're going to Haiti in December of 97. So right off the bat. And yeah. what I was going to say, there was four deployable fire stations, Fort Campbell, Fort Drum, Fort... Leonard Wood and Fort uh, Bragg when I first came in, and then they consolidated them. But there's only like three deployable fire departments for the Army. There's like 300 maybe at any time firefighters in the Army. Hmm. So it's pretty small MOS. So we get ready to go to Haiti, and, you know, like a week before we go out, you know, to bar slash dance slash Mm -hmm. restaurant slash a little bit of everything, you know. All in one. All in one place right outside Fort Leonard. I forget the name of it. And then I meet this blonde girl in there. And so we started hanging out for a couple of days. And day, day three, we decided we are going to get married. Hell yeah, that's fast. Yeah. When you know, you know. Yeah, she, she'll deny it, but she asked me. <laughs> I was like, all right, whatever. <laughs> Let me go to Haiti. You know, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. I'm down. So I'll leave my car for, I, you know, left everything I had and I went to Haiti and that was a good warm up deployment, I say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and, my, and then that blonde is my wife now, Jessica. But, uh, three yeah, days for the rest of your life. Three days. And so it was a week. And then, you know, we, <laughs> within that week, you know, we decided all this stuff and. You know, we got all your pre-deployment stuff, getting the vehicles ready, getting all your gear ready, and, you know, all your pre-briefs, what we're going to go into, rules of engagement, stuff like that, you know. Mm. 
And so we get ready to go to Haiti, you know. So this is 97. I think they invaded in 94, really liberated it. They had a couple of these little camps set up. So we get there, and we're doing crash fire rescue for the, in Port-au-Prince at the Haiti National Airport. Mm. So there's our camps right off the end of it. So any C-130s, whatever's coming in, if anything has any problems, we had a crash yeah. cruise out there. And we were replacing the Air Force at the time. So it was a uh, multi, you know, it was a... Uh, there was Marines. Everybody was there. So it was, you just, I, I'm kind of trying to think of a word, but multi. Multi-force effort. Yeah. You so, you, yeah, you re, one would replace the other, and you just kind of do your thing there, you know. So we replaced the Air Force, and we got. To- and so at this point, you're transitioning with the Air Force, uh, kind of taking over the gear, the command, everything over a number of weeks, and then you guys assumed the mission, I'm assuming, after that? Yeah, we did. Fort Bragg deployed with us, so they were there, too. And so we had two crash fire rescue trucks and then our tanker, which was deadline most of the time. Well, we, it was horrible. It, it wasn't even a tanker. It was a semi-trailer with a water, like they use for the engineers, to mm-hmm. spread water. Just a big bladder. Well, yeah, the big tanker, and it, it would have a thing on the back, and then they hooked up where we could try to pull water out of it. Mm-hmm. It's not a, like an actual fire tanker. It was just a truck that they gave us, and then mm-hmm. we had a Humvee, you know what I mean? But like the Which trailer is awesome break. in a firefight, in a, a, a fighting fires. When I get to Kosovo, I'll tell you about it. So, <laughs> did you get the tanker from the Marine Corps? Because that's about what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we probably passed it down to y'all. <laughs> that one. Yeah, that one. That one, that one probably went to the Marine Corps. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was horrible. So, yeah, the tra- the back brakes were locked up in it. it. We couldn't move it, so it's not like we could use it. So, our water supply was limited to what we could carry on the truck, which was mm-hmm. twenty five hundred liters. So for those crash trucks and then, uh, we, you know, it was really, I did more humanitarian assistance there than I did sure. any firefighting. I think we had one small fire by the, it was nothing, you know what I mean? Nothing compared to what happens in Kosovo. And then uh, a lot of things I would do since I already had my EMT was, uh, we do 24 hour shifts and we did the same thing. So like Fort Bragg would cover one day. I mean, we both covered, but. Four of the guys from Fort Bragg would be off, and four would be on, and then four of us would be off in force. Mm-hmm. And we would just rotate every other day. Mm-hmm. So you had time to go to the gym. Was it 24 <laughs> 24? Yeah. Yeah. So we did that because you can only put so many people on the truck. I mean, yeah. There's eight of us. So yeah. we would do whatever. I mean, if there's something in the middle of the night, yeah. But for the most part, they wasn't really there. You know what I mean? We did our thing during the day, standbys. Mainly the standbys is what you really do, isn't it? Just it's like on call. Well, if they're doing like a hot landing, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, or whatever, mm-hmm. or an in-flight emergency or anything like that, then you're going to sure. be out there. So. Sure. But there wasn't much of that, really, to be honest with you. So uh, I would go work in the hospital on my day off mm-hmm. and go out and go do, you know, help with field surgeries and stuff like that. So I was big into the medical. It was another niche, you know what I mean? And I knew that was the niche I needed to have because... It's so important to be able to do both, mm-hmm. and they go and they go coincide with each other. But you know, being a paramedic is where I wanted to be to get to, and so I just continue. And the the hospital always want if you. Here's the thing: if you want to do some work in the military, go volunteer somewhere. You know, somebody will be like, they'll take you. Mm-hmm. So the hospital's like, yeah, you got to you're an EMT, get over here. You yep. do this, this, and that. Yeah, it's different. It's a different practice in medicine in the military than it is. In the civilian world, the military was like, "Go do it." Yeah, in the civilian world, you got to have insurance and yeah, a thought process of not letting yourself do. But I'm sure y'all have the same like the 40 hour combat lifesaver course. I'm sure. Y'all, sure. Yeah. So mm-hmm. they're teaching to start IVs. They're teaching. Mm-hmm. So and a lot of a lot of the Marines will get live tissue training and and the soldiers. And so coming back in with live tissue training, that like the, there's, there's good gouge there, and you don't get to. Uh, necessarily volunteer for that you're voluntold to do that at least where i come from but mm, having that experience in a squad having that experience uh in that training all your stuff that you're gathering from volunteering and and doing the extra miles doing nothing but make you better at your job so yeah and that was another place in my life like haiti was where i really said well i had, probably had some ptsd from my mother and sure some other traumatic stuff that happened as a child but 
Uh, Haiti was horrible, man. Like the trash. Look up city of the river of trash in Haiti. Mm-hmm. Just YouTube that. And you know, I've I've seen I've seen legs sticking out of trash when the hogs have eaten the meat off of it up to the foot. Like it was still in a shoe. Yeah, human remains, man. There's no joke there. They wouldn't kill people for stealing and bash their heads in with rocks and put tires on them and set them on fire and people would fall off a truck they'd run over them in the streets they wouldn't move them there was dead bodies there was decaying at different stages i mean there was it's a bad place mm-hmm. you know it's hard and and people live in poverty man we, mm-hmm. we don't know what poverty is I, I like i said i grew up i always say i grew up poor but i didn't grow up like they did you know what i mean and that changed my perspective on life mm-hmm. and that really that first deployment i mean you know being in haiti didn't do a lot but mentally it was it did a lot taxing. you know taxing i talked about that last night with uh or last time we recorded with john and glenn his episode will be coming it'll be yeah actually it just already played so um you're after him but i talked to him about a lot of the things that uh affected my brain or my mental well-being from combat was not killing people was not doing operations not doing hits uh it was more the cultural uh, the differences in the culture and the cultural dynamic between value of life on a human being versus the rest of the world and in america we we do hold that value we hold it high for the individual in a lot of other places um, the livestock can be treated better than the children and uh you know and the like and when you go to these places and you see the way that they'll leave bodies laying around, you know, the, the decay, the smell, nobody's cleaning that up. It, it's brutal. It's a brutal, it's a brutal thing. And, and, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to take the view on it, our people are so free that they don't even know that exists most of the time yeah. in large swaths and populations of America. And so it's like they get the romanticized version of what, the army does and what the Marines do and what the rest of the world's like. But, you know, then you talk about, uh, Haiti, Kosovo, hell, even Afghanistan right now with the American people got a glimpse, just a small glimpse of what the rest of the world does. And they come unglued about it. And, yeah. uh, it's like, no, this is, this, you, you live in the best place to live at the best time to live in any place. And so as a human being, so, uh, somebody that's unlucky that gets born on the other side of the world. And that's all it is. It's unluck, uh, unlucky that they end up in a situation where they're in. And, uh, and then the cultural differences can really drive, um, shards into the brain. I mean, that's for sure. Yeah. There was, you know, there was a lot of stuff over there that, I mean, I brought back mentally, you know, my mm-hmm. wife said I was different, but then again, we knew each other for a week. So obviously you're going to be different. <laughs> I mean, fact, fact, and yeah. you're going to change regardless if I knew her or didn't know her. You I could have known her for 20 years and she didn't notice the difference. She knows the difference, but mm. you know, that, that really started the, the dark times and I just would keep chasing, chasing more schools, chasing more work, chasing more whatever to, to run away from this stuff, you know, yeah. and it, it really... You know, it had its moments, you know, and like any time you want to be home, you don't really want to be there all the time, but, you know, helping, you know, you think you want to be doing a good cause. I mean, you think you want to be there for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to help th- this nation. And I, I think that at some point you do, uh, um, you know, our actions do help. 100%. 100%. It may, may affect one little kid to become president and change that nation. You know what I mean? hundred percent. The military was there handing him food and that's all he needed for that day, you know? And that's what people don't see. They, they see all the killing and the, all the bad stuff, but they don't see all the good that you do. It's because they want to see that. I think. Yeah, maybe so. That's what sells. I mean, Americans are attracted to that. Human beings are attracted, you know, Not MMA, like, anything. I yeah, mean, you, you want to watch people tear each other apart. You want to, you know, and, and, and then in our society there's a lot of drama. So they want to see the drama. And if and it bleeds, like, it leads. Mm hmm. And so it's been that way. Because it makes ratings. Yep. Yeah. So we get through with Haiti. We do our six months there. We get back. Uh, you know, it, it went smooth. I mean, for the most part, we didn't. We're really not there to, to be soldiers. We're there to be crash fire rescue mm-hmm. at this point, you know. Uh, we, we leave the compounds every now and then. And the rules engagement was like 
the only people you could shoot at was with Molotov cocktails, and they had to be actively throwing them at you. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of rules engagement. Other than that, it was just... Yeah, and, because we've been there, had a presence there for a long time, already made mistakes there in the past with our militaries and uh, some of their liberty incidents, and it's like, hey, we don't need an international crisis, yeah, so, so they got to really rein it in. Yeah, it was really, but it wasn't like a violent, I mean, we would go out in towns, and they would have like their little Walmart, we called it, you know, like the bazaar, they mm. make wooden stuff, I got the wooden statue right there, it's from Haiti, it's my little Indian guy, you yeah. know. And, you know, I had a chest made with our name in it. And, 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 sure. And we had a couple of Haitian kids that would shine our boots on base. You know what I mean? They would, and, you know. Yeah, they police call there, too, for the Marines. Yeah. They come and get all the breasts before you can. Yeah, we had a couple. They had a little, uh, little shop that mm-hmm. they had this little, like, gazebo set up. And you go in there and take your boots, and it was like a dollar. You know what I mean? You get your boots shined. And, and as soon as you put them on and walk out on the gravel and the dust, they'd be horrible. But we were still shining boots, and that's what it had to be, you know. Mm-hmm. So. I'd rather give these kids that money. I just shine my own boots all the time, but that help money goes man. to help help them eat. And, you know, a lot of times they wouldn't rather say, hey, can you get me a fan from the PX? Or, yeah, you know what I mean? What they're supposed to. But 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I'll shine your boot for a whole month if you get me a fan or if you can get me a pair of shoes or something. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, if you had a pair of shoes, you can trade for anything over there. Mm-hmm. You know? And it was just... Uh, we got to work with a bunch of different uh, UN, Argentina. They got to, Argentina, there was some other people there. I can't remember, but it was a, like a UN task force kind of thing. They mm-hmm. were on the under, other end of the runway, so sure. we'd do a little work with them and training with them. But for the most part, it was a smooth six months, non-combative, you know. That's, that's good. Yeah. So we, and so you come back from that, and I assume you come back from that and – I get married as soon as I get she back. She passed the deployment test. She passed it. Well, she already had my license, the marriage license and everything done. So we're three days home and we're Boom. married on the court steps. So That's right. So we're at 23, 24 years. We're working 24 years now. You got me beat. I know. <laughs> but uh, So you guys get married and then are you up for orders to go to a new unit? Are you up to, no, to make a decision whether you stay in or get out at this point? Or No, no. We're like, I'm... I'm a year and a half in, bro. I got four year enlistment. So, oh, this is right in the beginning. Yeah, okay, yeah, I we're mean, still I, right I, in the beginning. Yeah, I get, I get to the unit, I deploy, go to Haiti, yep. come back, and I'm home for a year. And during that time, I, you know, I, I start volunteering at the hospital because I'm just, I'm kind of, in a secret way, just craving that kind of mm. chaos because mm. that's a chaos I just came from. Yeah, something you were comfortable with. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm good at what I do. Yeah. I really am. I'm good, and, you know, and not to brag, but I thought I was a good, damn good medic and a good, a good firefighter. So, you know, I was working at the hospital. I probably did like a thousand hours there, man. A volunteer time. Mm. And that's awesome. The, you know, there was some SFPA guys, and I knew all the medics, and we trained with them on the fire department. So, I pretty much got to do what I wanted to do in the ER. Mm-hmm. I'd go to the ER. I'd work, work codes, get experience, get all this. Stuff that you're not getting, like, every day at the fire department. You're, yes, not, you're not getting all this trauma. Mm. You're not getting all these injuries. And so that was a big learning curve. So we did a year. You know, we're home for about a year, and then we get orders to go to Kosovo. And this is 99. Is this accompanied, or is this a, a non-accompanied pump? Uh, we, we just deploy as our eight people. No, no, I mean with your family. It's not a family no, deployment. A no, no, no. This is deployment to okay, Kosovo. Gotcha, gotcha. They're liberating Kosovo. They're bombing this, the Serbs. The Bosnia. Yeah, yeah. So we get orders. We go to first. We go to Albania. That's that's where we start off. So we get ready to deploy. We do that. Do the workup. Get ready. All the briefs. You know, landmine training. Landmines are everywhere there. So mm-hmm. you're going through all that stuff. You know, rules of engagement. Blah blah blah. We get ready and we deploy. So we go to Albania. We come in. We land in Albania. And we're doing crash fire rescue with the uh, Air Force, mm-hmm. who are on the left side of the runway, and we're on the right side of the runway. And the French are working the French fire department. They have their, their military fire departments there too, so it's multinational. Mm-hmm. NATO, you know, uh, we we wind up getting the NATO medal out of it, mm-hmm. working with all the NATO groups. But 
So this starts the deployment, and there, you know, there's artillery. They're flying in with hot jet. I mean, you got F-16s losing oil pressures. So the, the in-flight emergencies change. We went from not doing much to like there's some serious shit going on here, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we have a big fire on the end of the runway. Some, it's funny. So they have these old <laughs> shitters out there where the burn pits. Yeah, still burning. Stirring them. Yeah. And so one guy poured I don't know how much fuel in it, lit it off, blew some people off of it. <laughs> Oh, but there's man. toilet seats everywhere. There's this big, looks like a a bomb going off at the end of the runway, and uh, so we respond to this, and we're bringing up the crash trucks, and <laughs> there's fire everywhere. And these, you know, it's probably fifteen of them in length, and they're wooden like Porter Jones. Yeah. And uh, the friends are out there, and they don't have the same gear we have. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't have the same structural gear. They have leather jackets and high boots and these weird little helmets, and they don't have the same gear, so. The guy that was driving the truck, it wasn't me that day, but he wound up hitting him with foam with one of the turrets <laughs> trying to get it on there, and, and it was turned into a fiasco. So that was our first. He hit the French? Yeah, the Frenchies, yeah. A shit show, to it be literal. A, it was a shit show. <laughs> Quite literally. Uh, there was more training after that, and <laughs> they didn't have any more burn shitters neither, so because they, they got rid of them. I'm sure they did. Yeah, but. Probably seems like it may be. Yeah. Well, see, it was, the Air Force was built up on their side, of obviously. They had gravel pads, chow hall, you know, a place to take a shower. We were in the mud. They had hemets buried up to the doors. We had to dig trenches around our GP mediums, you know. So the water, we were, you got two cots, one to stand on to change because there was water. It was in the flood season, and it was just horrible. Fun times. Fun times. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I love it. So, th- so it turned into where <clears throat> at night we were taking some sniper fire. There's rounds. There's a lot of not some nights where we'd have to be on the deck for a while, you know, in our GP mediums, and you know we didn't do much in Albania other uh-huh. than the crapper fire and some in-flight emergencies. And you see the crapper fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big crapper fire of Albania. Yeah. So. 99. Love it. 99. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> Alumni, you know, so uh, we there, we're there for a month and then we get, we're going to go into Kosovo. Uh-huh. And so um, we're, with, we're attached to the Big Red One. I think we're going to be attached to the Big Red One. They're still in Germany at the time. And uh, they're they're engineering, so they're their whole engineer. So this is like a structure, like graders, scrapers, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. dozers, any kind of construction work. Like their form, they're engineers. Yep. So it's like the CBs are coming in, they're sure. rolling in. So they got two hundred pieces of heavy equipment, and they rent this ship out of Italy. It's like five decks, and it holds all of it. So I have to take the fire truck with us, obviously. So I drive that on the ship. We take a three or four day cruise. Kosovo. We go into um, Thessaloniki in Greece. Okay. That's where we come into port. Okay. So then we're going to convoy from Greece to Kos- to Macedonia and then into Kosovo. That's how it's going to go down. Yeah. So we get there. We get all the stuff loaded off the ship. We're there maybe eight hours trying to sleep, do whatever. It's hot. We're just sleeping on the ground. Yeah. We're getting ready for this convoy. Can't get off the roads. Uh, mines, you know, you're stressing that big time. Yeah. And you're rolling 200 pieces of heavy equipment through these foreign countries you know it was a little bit of a pucker factor does it seem odd when you were doing it well there was a lot of stuff from in greece that was like go away americans and swastikas and some Mm. other stuff painted on the walls i mean we really wasn't like i don't have a problem with greece it just at that point it wasn't i'm not sure that we were really welcomed at the time Mm. and then uh but we didn't stay there long so It was, we were there, and we rolled out, mm-hmm. you know, so we convoy up, we get to Macedonia, we in process for a week, do some more briefings, we're yep. going to go into Kosovo, and they're getting ready to move everything in, so we convoy up, and we get to wherever we're going to get to go, and it's a wheat field, and they're knocking the wheat down, they're building the base that day, <laughs> so we're driving in on just freshly dozed mud, and we get there. And it's Camp Bond still. It's about to form. And so, you know, being the, being who we were, kind of stepchildren, you know what I mean, as our unit, because yeah. we're eight people, we wind up putting up 64 GP mediums in one day. And 
<laughs> helping the big red. You know, I mean, we got sleep, so it's before KBR got in there. So yeah, we did that. And we start, and they had some the helicopter pads built, so we were doing crash fire rescue with them, and then yeah, really no, no no helicopter stuff, no aircraft. Like I was lucky in my career that I never really had a huge aircraft fire. We've uh-huh. had some flame engines out, whatever, but sure, nothing like I had to go to a crash or it was fully involved or they crashed on the runway, stuff like nothing like that. Right, luckily, so right. really nothing with the Hueys and the. The Cobras and the 58 Deltas that they're flying, you know. Sure. No, no problems with that. And so, however, the Serbs and Albanians are burning each other out, man, because we're trying to liberate the country. So we're in the Kosovo. We get there, and they're burning schools. They're burning churches. They're burning hospitals. And so I don't know how long it is before we're in there, but the, the decision was made, to, like, we're going to go help out in the town. mm and so the, the idea was they were burning at night. Arson was running around, setting fire to shit. And then we would go do our, you know, and they, they had they all had some old firefighters with a truck. They couldn't go in. They didn't have the right gear. You know, that's what they had in that town. Sure. And so we start helping with if it was like a church or a school or something was on fire, a business. It depended on who they were, if they were helping, I guess. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But... It was made by the command, and it was came down that we were going to go and fight fires out in the city. So, our first night, we roll out, escorted by the MPs, man. And so, we got four, I think four armed Humvees rolling out with, in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. And we go, and they set up a perimeter. We set up a fire truck, man. We start fighting fire. We're in here fighting fire, and, you know, we come out, and the MPs are gone. Oh. They went. They had to go like some other mission. They left us out there with no radios. We didn't have no comms back to the base. We didn't know where the hell we were. And we were taking. Then we started taking some rounds. Just come flying in, you know, pretty close. And we're like, we gotta get the fuck out of here, you know. <laughs> we're like, we gotta get some comms. We gotta get out of here. We don't. We're not fighting fire anymore, you know. We only had our M16s, uh-huh. and that was the four dudes in the Humvee, right? Because we can't carry the M16s. When we're fighting fire. Mm-hmm. So four dudes are doing their thing. Four dudes is like. That's all we got because mm-hmm. the MPs left us. So when we got back to base, the MPs did not escort us out anymore. <laughs> I'm sure. 82nd escorted us out. That's a whole lot more comfort. Uh, yeah. They rolled out. It, they were awesome, man. They we uh, they would set up perimeter for us. We'd fight fire. We'd do our thing all night, and they would just. And they just chill watching you back. Yeah. Really? You know. And so luckily we didn't get into me. I mean, there was like just – Pop off rounds. There were no gunfights, so luckily, I didn't have to shoot my weapon in mm-hmm. anger, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so we did our thing, and we wound up fighting over sixty fires, sixty structural fires in six months. And it just turned into where all we would do was at night would fight fire, mm-hmm. come back, sleep during the day. Now, are they burning <laughs> during the day too, or is it typically not much at night? Because there's a, there's a couple of times like there's one night where we, we was with eighty second and. Uh, it was my. It wasn't. It wasn't my night to be on the fire truck. I was in the Humvee, and they're like, "You got to come with us, man. We're going to go on a patrol." So I was like, "You realize I don't do this stuff all the time, right?" <laughs> they're like, "Yeah, but we need you." So we were. They were after an arson, and we were just patrolling the streets, man, locked and Is loaded, ready to go with the eighty second. Eighty second. Okay. Yeah. So I did that one night. <laughs> did you guys find him? No, man. No. He was. They were running around just lighting stuff off, and by the time because we'd come fight one, and then they'd be over on the other side of town lighting something off, and it wasn't. 82nd of them guys would chase them, try to chase them down and do things. And there's a lot of things that went on there. Like I said, you know, they tried to get us to fight fire one time in a minefield. We were like, we're not doing that. You know, I mean, if it comes to closer to the road, we'll consider it. But Ill advised. We're not doing that. So, yeah. you know, there was some stuff that was dumb. And then I got electrocuted a little bit over there. And That's good. How'd that happen? Well, one, I kicked the door in this one place, and there was a transformer, and it blew up, like, right in my face. Mm. And I'm, it's just, a, like, a bright flash of light, like, nothing I've never seen. Like, like a welder arc or something? Yeah. Yeah. It just, like, and most of all their houses and stuff were on the same grid, so it's not like you could shut the grid down to fight fire. Mm. And so we had a ladder on a building, and it was, the building was kind of charged due to a line being down. So when I grabbed the ladder, it was like, you could feel it, but it wasn't nothing like 
knocking you down. You feel the vibrations coming through. Yeah, you're like, you know, it lights you up a little bit. <laughs> so we're like, you know, like we was trying to shut down stuff. And a lot of these buildings were 100 years old and they're connected mm-hmm. with roofs. And, mm-hmm. you know, the fire would just spread to different stuff. And, it, you know, but the people of Kosovo, man, they were great people, you know. Like we'd fight fire, put out their business or whatever. They'd try to offer us cigarettes, <laughs> alcohol we couldn't take. You know, but they were grateful, and uh, it comes full circle on Kosovo here a little bit when I tell you about it. But uh, we did six months there, and uh, then we were replaced by Fort Drum. They came in after us, mm-hmm. you know, because we did six month rotations, and then a <laughs> different fire department come in, <coughs> and then maybe another fire department come in. And then by that time, KBR was usually set up. And then they would bring in their stuff at a different, the civilian contractors, sure. which I do later right? for KBR. So, okay. Yeah. I spent 13 months in Afghanistan as a contractor for KBR doing the same thing. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Crash fire rescue structural. So we got out of Kosovo and, you know, come home and within a month I couldn't walk up my stairs, man. Like. I'm just excruciating knee pain. Knees. Knees. And and so we go to the doctor, and they're like, man, yeah, your knees are fucked up, you know. Uh, so my, it's coming up on the <coughs> end of my four-year enlistment. So they, we decided to extend me one year in the Army to do two surgeries. Ch- ch- try to get you better, yeah. Try to get you better before I get out, you know, because I'm not going to be able to do PT test. I gained a bunch of weight. You know, I just... It, it, just blew my mind, you know what I mean? Like, 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 are we gonna have to be done? And uh, so I have two surgeries. Uh, and these are what was wrong? Arthritis? Is that? Yeah, just like wearing them out, man. I just like wore them out from all the running I was doing. Mm-hmm. One PT and then, and You're on a big frame. I'm a big dude, you know. Carrying a lot of weight. I'm, I'm too. I lost 40 pounds in basics, so I'm 230, 240, mm-hmm. you know, lifting weights, staying in shape, running all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how I control my weight. And, uh, yeah, they're just worn out. Yeah. And I'm Check. 20-something years old, man, and having two surgeries. And so uh, 9-11 happens between my two surgeries, you know, and uh, this is the day after 9-11, so I want to say to the – 343 brothers I lost that day. Thank Although, you. Yep. Yep. And and we're not going... I say we, but in 20 years, it's amazing how many people have forgot to me. Um, yeah. I don't forget. No. I got, I got, a, I got a thing that... Uh, I don't forget that. I know what I was doing when it happened. Mm. I was in I was in rehab. For my knee, and I was sitting in rehab watching it on TV, and mm-hmm. they called us. You know, they called us all in. You know, I was on medical leave, and they're like, "No, you're showing your ass up to the company, brother. Everybody's mm-hmm. coming in." And so, mm-hmm. you know, they locked down the base. We didn't know what. You know, nobody knew what the fuck was going on. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just chaos. And so, did you I, watch the plane sit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched the right after the first one. I watched them fall. I was at like I said, and then they. After the second one fell, it wasn't long before we had orders back to the company. Yeah. And we didn't know what if they were going to try to send our unit to go help or not. Right. We, we were like, we wanted to go. Like, we could have benefited from it. Or been, they could have benefited. But it didn't work out that way. There was a bigger plan. They were, Yeah. They would be getting ready to go to Iraq, which I don't make. Because of the I'm getting, Yeah, I'm getting out. So, I'm getting med set. So, I do my med board. They find me disabled at 0%. And, you know, pay me some money to get out, and that's it. And so, that's my army career, man. And and, but I got so much out of it. Mm. I got the training and experiences of a lifetime that mm-hmm. a lot of people don't get. And so, mm-hmm. you know, going through the fire academy EMT, I went to paramedic school when I was in. I was doing my college, got my first degree there, and uh, you know, doing the things I needed to do to move up. And mm-hmm. so, really, what I wanted to do was go work for the government doing the same thing and I did so I got out of uh, February of 2002 I was in from 97 to 2002 mm-hmm. and then I went to Fort Monmouth 
uh, in New Jersey. I started my civilian fire career there and working know, for working for the as fire a department. civilian firefighter as a civilian for the base for the government. Yeah. Okay. Yep. A DOD mm-hmm, employee. Mm-hmm. So that's where I would spend pretty much my next fifteen years is with the uh, government fighting fire, except for the thirteen months I took off. And you're a paramedic at this point, or no? I went to paramedic school, didn't get to finish testing. And then I was deployed to Kosovo and come back, and it was like, man, nah, whatever. Gotcha. I was out. Couldn't really get to finish doing the, what I needed to do, so I wound up going back to paramedic school later. Check. Again. Check. And it was just it made it easier, mm-hmm. really, mm-hmm. doing it the second time. There's so much, so much you already learned, but there's so much that you're taught. That it's in this crammed in such I mean, it's a lot of medical information mm-hmm. that people don't realize, and it, it's tough. Mm-hmm. It's, it's tougher than the paramedic test was tougher than the RN test wow. my, my nursing test but I also had 10 something years of experience as a medic and so 10 years as a medic is going to lead you up and set you up for success in the future obviously in all the training that you've garnered from your different units now and so kick into that yeah so I just uh, when I was in Alabama I got went to, uh, so I went to work for the government Worked at different bases. Uh, I went from Fort Monmouth to McAllister, which is back in Oklahoma. I was around family, and then I transferred to Tinker. Uh, this was went back to medic school, got my medic, and then uh, this was around 2007. So mm-hmm. I did some contract. I, I signed up for KBR mm-hmm. with all my experience. They, you know, I signed up on Friday. They called me on Monday and offered me a job to go to Afghanistan. So. It was a short process. I pretty much resigned from the government because you couldn't do both. Mm-hmm. And so I went to work. I went to Afghanistan in 2007. And what are you doing for KBR? Fire? Fire rescue. Okay. Same thing, EMS. Okay. And so I get over there, spend the first first three months in Kandahar. And we're doing base stuff. So in-flight emergencies is really what we're dealing with. They're doing a lot of hot missions. They're flying. You got the... Uh, you got drones. They're flying drones. They're flying Harriers. They're flying mm-hmm. F-16s on the end in Kandahar. And so, anytime they're loading, unloading bombs, whatever they're going to do, sometimes they drop them. Sometimes, you know, they're coming in hot and mm-hmm. in flight emergencies. And so we did that. Really, not a lot, really, to be like crash or not a lot of fires. And so, that's the good part about it is when there's not fires because nobody's losing stuff and nobody's getting in danger. So. Those are the best times, I say. Yeah, for sure. You know, I don't want anybody to lose anything. Mm. And, but so uh, promotion comes up for Bagram. I go up there, and then I'm a station ca- I'm station captain there. Okay. And At actual so, Bagram. In Bagram, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I did three months in Kandahar, and then with KBR there was a promotion, so I went up to Bagram, and then spent the rest of the ten months doing the same thing in Bagram. Mm-hmm. But now we're flying F-15s. There's they're doing sorties all night. You know, and mm-hmm. we're right next to them, so whatever they had coming in, a lot of naval and flight emergencies running. They'll catch the barrier or I have to run the tapes, you know, when you're out there doing training, aircraft egress, you know, working with the pilots, working with the crews, mm-hmm. you know, it's always something you're, you're always training, doing something. So mm-hmm. I do this. It goes pretty much, pretty, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't horrible. Okay. So Afghanistan to me wasn't horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a few parts like with vehicles coming in after IEDs that had to be sprayed out, stuff like that, the blood, the the bad stuff. You know what I mean? There's stuff and like you that. You get the pleasure of doing that. Ah, uh, we did a couple of times, I believe. Weird. It seems weird to me that they wouldn't clean their own vehicles out. But well, you just hose it out with a big hose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so you're using like the fire hose just to? Yeah. Okay. 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 I got you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just kind of hose them out. Or yeah. Not fun to clean a vehicle out after a strike. That's for sure. Yeah. So. I get back from Afghanistan and shit. Really, and my mental illness is probably worse. Mm-hmm. It's been it's getting worse and getting worse. I'm just kind of running from it, really. Mm-hmm. Nightmares, not really hallucinations at this point, but uh, it's not no sleep. Like I'm not working. I like I'll go days without sleep. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it's just it just gets worse. And so I get back. From uh, I get back into the DOD after I get back out of Afghanistan. I was applying for jobs, so I came back to Fort Leonard Wood for a little stint, and then I went to Anniston, Alabama, as a firefighter paramedic there. Mm-hmm. 
So I picked that up. I did a while there. Then I went to Alabama Fire College and got like all my certs from Fire Officer 4 down. Yeah. All my technical rescue stuff. So I knocked everything out down there. And then I was instructing for Alabama Fire College for a little bit. Teaching rope rescue. Done that, you know, a little bit of stuff like that with them. And then this kind of clicks on until about... Then I go out to White Sands for a promotion for a captain job out there. And where is that at? New Mexico. Okay. So I leave Aniston. I go out there. I spent a couple of years there as a captain. And then a good friend of mine and I decided we were going to come back here because we dove here mm-hmm. from diving. And so when we lived, when we worked together in Alabama, we'd drive up to Jacksonville, North Carolina, go up to Moorhead, and we'd dive. You know, the U-boat. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever dove it, but if you get no, a chance. No, I've heard of it. It's an amazing piece of history to see that U boat sitting on them at 110 feet. You know what I mean? It's pretty cool to be able to touch it. You know, mm-hmm. there's still people in there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a gravesite. But so we decided we were going to come here. And so I took a job at Camp Lejeune. Came here as a fire medic. I took a demotion. Did a couple of years here. That was the thing about the government. You could transfer. That was the amazing thing about it. So you can go somewhere else. I did do two or three years at a place. I get tired of it and be like, well, I go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And as long as you're willing to move. No problem. Yeah, you're not losing tenure. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You still, mm-hmm. how many years in, you still got your same certs. Mm-hmm. It's not like going into a new fire department and starting at the bottom. Mm-hmm. You do come in, you're still new, but you've already got these credentials and they already, you already sure. know where you stand, right? So right. Training-wise. So they're doing 24 on, 24 off here at Camp Lejeune, and I'm not, I don't like that really. We were doing 48-72, which is a better schedule to me. Mm-hmm. You do the two days, but you got the three days off and it mm-hmm. allows you to do more things, especially with your family, getting things done, doctor's appointments, blah, blah, sure. blah, stuff like that. So I transferred to Cherry Point and we were doing some training. And, uh, so it comes up to January of 2016. I got to have a knee replacement. Mm-hmm. My knees are just totally shot. I don't know how many surgeries I'm in at this time, but I've had like 13 total, nine on the left and four on the right. Now, now, point, now, yeah, yeah, at this yeah, point yeah. in my life. So, uh, and and not to cut you off, but is this, um, are we looking at this as a hereditary thing? Uh, like, cause I know you're, you, you had mentioned that your mother before she had passed had the, you know, like the degenerative arthritis. Is it, is this a hereditary issue? It may be at some point, but also there's a wear and tear issue from, yeah, yeah. you know, all the running, sure. marching, sure. everything you do in the military. And, and it was a firefighter for 20 years. You just wear your body out. Mm-hmm. Lifting patients. I mean, that's... And the gear and the kit and the weight yeah. and the... Yeah, absolutely. You know, the the you're, mountains. You're, yeah, you're, if you're climbing mountains. I mean, you just... Yeah, you're carrying all kinds of gear all the time. Yep. And, you know, you just wear stuff out, you know? Check. And so, I have this knee replacement. And then in September, I, I go to pick up a ladder. It's a 150-pound ladder. It's a, really like a three-person lift, but we did it with two. And I just felt my knee pop out. Like the prosthetic popped and so i injured my knee and so i'm fucking going to have my mental fucking breakdown mm-hmm. but to be honest with you i was already burned out as mm-hmm. fuck anyway mm-hmm. i mean i was having hallucinations at work and waking up thinking i'm got to go pick up dead kids and there's no call and looking like an idiot and mm-hmm. shit like that you know it's mm-hmm. just i'm not jiving mentally if you get what I'm saying, mm-hmm. like, I need some help. So, uh, during the period of me having surgeries, I start going to the vet center. And that's where I wound up meeting you mm-hmm. and, and a bunch of other friends I have today. But I started therapy and, you know, did some couple individual appointments. And then they got me into a group. And then I was like, hey, this is a safe place to be for me. There was an art group, and I got into that, and I started really, that's when I started getting back into art. Mm-hmm. So this is where the art blossoms. Mm-hmm. And so I'm doing these art groups, and then I'm doing art every day. Mm-hmm. And I'm having all these surgeries. I wound up getting an infection. Uh, you know, but I'm starting these groups. So that's helping. But however, so I hurt my knee. It comes December. This is in September. So December, they decide to go in and do a poly exchange of the knee. Mm-hmm. Try to correct what they can and sew me back up and be good to go, you know, and go back to work. And so they go in there, they do the poly exchange, and, and two weeks later, I'm back in the hospital having the same surgery done because I have staph infection. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, the day I went to the hospital, you know, I was hallucinating horribly bad. You know, I walked into a bathroom and there was a dead guy laying in. Can't say if it was somebody I took care of in my lifetime, Mm -hmm. but he was just dead laying in my bathtub. And I was like, you can't be real because I'm trying to talk to myself, like trying to rationalize in my head that this can't be real. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one here. But he gets up. And then he's standing behind me in the mirror. And it's just it's crazy shit that day. Like spiders attacking me. Like millions of and spiders. And do we have a, a medical explanation for your hallucinations? Well, I'm sure due to the infection, the systemic infection, maybe. I don't know. Mm, uh, I didn't fever. know. Fever. With... You know, I had blood shooting out of my leg. Like it would squirt. It would just, there was, a, I had a knot on the end of my knee. I got video of it. And it's just shooting blood out, like in the shower. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's horrible. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they put a pick line in. You know, I'm on IV antibiotics uh, like three times a day. I'm giving to myself oral antibiotics. And this goes on for three, two or three months. And then they're like, the surgery didn't take, man. This knee's still fucked up. And so I had to switch doc- different doctors. Had to get cleaned up as in infection-wise with an infection control doctor. Mm-hmm. So they try to kill everything, get everything dot killed, you know, the staff, and then they plan to go in there and take everything out, make sure the infection's dead behind the bone. Like that's the main thing with a prosthetic already being in there. They mm-hmm. want the infection dead because it can live under the bone, under the metal in the bone. And so they took everything out. So for like a full month of April of 2017, I didn't have a knee at all. I just mm-hmm. had, I had a spacer in there. There was an antibiotic spacer. And then in May, like 5th or 6th, they put the new knee in. And then it was just recovery from there. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I wanted, they let, let me go from work, you know. So now I don't have a fucking job. I don't know what to do. Uh, I'm burned out as a medic. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, my PTSD, PTSD is horrible. I mean, I've been getting treatment for it, but I'm angry as fuck. <clears throat> you know, I'm angry. Uh, I just, I'm pissed off at everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just taking shit out on my family. It's not fair to them. And, you Would know, you just, say that uh, when you got, when you let go, regardless of, uh, regardless of your situation, uh, surely that affected your family, but did that affect you on a purpose level? Like you maybe have spent your entire life with this purpose and with this, you yeah, know, I've this, been, this service to people, and then all of a sudden somebody says, Hey, you can't do this anymore. Yeah. That's, a, that's tough to deal with. That didn't come till a little bit later. Mm-hmm. It was mainly the financial part because mm-hmm. you go from making this much money to not having that money and waiting on your medical retirement. I had to medically retire, is what it really came down to. And mm-hmm. That took seven or eight months before the paperwork went through, and it's a stack of paperwork, and nobody really tells you how to fill it out. And mm-hmm. I don't really don't know how I did it mentally. Uh, you know, my wife helped me. She's amazing. So, anyway, got retired, and I start working on art, and I start going to a program called Creative Creative Forces at mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. It meets. It's a national endowment for the arts. They support like art therapy. It's here in town, and it's changed names now. It's creative Discoveries, but it's a, for veterans and their families. And sure. Have art open studio five to nine on Wednesdays at the Arts Council in Jacksonville. If anybody wants to check it out, absolutely I'd love to see you every, y'all get down plugged there. In. Yeah, I get plugged in. But I'm doing mo- most of my groups at the vet center, my art groups, and so mm-hmm. you know, at this point, I'm free to do whatever I want mm-hmm. artistically. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have nothing going on. I'm laid up. I can't do nothing. I'm just, you know, I don't know what to do, and so I start expressing it artistically and Mm -hmm. i just keep doing it and this Mm -hmm. continues on for till now so from 2017 to now i've been creating art yeah and i think 17 would have been around when we would have met yes i think in group and started coming in i started going to all groups really yeah 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 yeah, yeah. you started filling your time up being i needed structure a lot of it and i used to be at work for 24 hours and and home for 24 hours, you know, have something to do. And I was sick. I'm still sick. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Still trying to recover from that, you know, that surgery. That was horrible. You know, those four surgeries in five months. And 
You know, my right knee is still bad. My back has been fused. I've had two rotator cuff tears. You know, it's like my body's broke down. Mm-hmm. And people, you know, they look at you, you, you know, you can see with the knee braces, but not everything. But mentally, I was broke down even worse. Yeah. That was where I was really hurting. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't getting the help. I didn't, I was, I needed a lot more help. And mm-hmm. so I started attending all the groups and that's where I met you and then. Yeah, we started fishing, and we started uh, hanging out, uh, families. Uh, there was a little core of us that even still hang out and fish and, okay. and everything to this day. Um, I remember the first time I started seeing your portfolios, you'd bring them in a group or something like that, and I'd see, I'm like, man, dude, you're really good. Like, ah, and you'd always be bashful. Like, ah, yeah, I was just doing this on my spare time. I'm like, nah, nah, like I would... I would pay pretty good money for somebody to do this for me. So if I, I consider myself pretty rational. And if I would pay you money for some of these uh, expressions of emotion through art, then I know. So we start talking about that. And then I, I remember mentioned to you, you know, a couple of years ago, Hey, I'm going to do this. And when I do this, I want some art. I want some of your art because, yeah. because I want people, I appreciate your art. Um, your art is in my house in multiple places. And like I told you offline, like I had you paint a lion after I, after I published my book, I'm, I'm a lion guy. That's you know, that's my little creature. That's my, that's my thing. And, uh, you paint this lion. And like I tell my wife looks at me, Matt knows every day I walk into my room and I just stare at it because it's just, that is something that I appreciate. And so I wanted to have you come on and just talk about, you know, a lifetime of service doesn't always give you the warm and fuzzy uh, good experiences and good emotions. And sometimes a lifetime of service can be uh, just as much as a, a, of a gift as it is a curse. And, it is. And, uh, and people sometimes don't realize that, you know, uh, I talk about people that, you know, travel through their daily lives and they live in this, the, the greatest, you know, republic ever formed on the planet at the greatest time. And they walk around and they don't know you. They don't, and it's not that you want them to know you, but in my opinion, I want them to know the giants that they walk around with. These people that have dedicated their entire life to service for perfect strangers. And, you know, a lot of times we have a lot of good experiences. We have a lot of good fond memories and we build relationships and things like that. And then sometimes you're hallucinating about people you weren't able to get to or weren't able to save or were able to save, depending on how your brain's working that day. And uh, it comes with... A lifetime of service comes with a lifetime of baggage is 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 kind of how it how it gets and i'm not saying that everything's baggage but there's things in service that you don't want to relive every night yeah and i've had some things go on here lately that's has been really hard on me is the hallucinations mm-hmm. hallucinating at night I, i'm up all night mainly i go to bed early i try to have good sleep hygiene good habit mm-hmm. uh, I take my meds as accordingly, and then I go to sleep, and then I'm up one, two, three, and then I'm up, you know, the rest of the night. But there is a point where I'm just seeing these people. They're clear. They're mm-hmm. clear people that roam around this house, and I don't know what they are, but they haven't done anything to me. But I see them on a, I see them on many times. Mm. It's not like oh, it was just a dream, but it's not. Do they a, scare you? They do. Frightening. They're frightening. So it's not a positive. It's uh, not a positive ex- vibe. Experience ever. Ah, uh, no. Yeah. No. I've mm-hmm. told them, you know, under God's name to get out of my house. You know, I don't know what they are. And I don't know if it's uh, just maybe the PTSD that's just. Could be. Could be. Or uh, do you, have, in your career, in your life, did you take any blows to the head? Football. Yeah, I mean. You, Explosions. Uh, grenades, stuff like that. You mean you know, small explosions? I mean, the, and the only reason I ask is because I have. They're really that transformer blowing up in my face. That's that's, that's a big what one. I was gonna say. I mean, I'm just something like that. Um, and, and we don't know enough about the brain. Let's be honest. Um, but CTE is big in the talks right now. And yeah. you look at these football players, and you look at the documentaries and the movies that they've made about CTE, trying to bring awareness to it. And it's like. Okay, this is a disease that we can't diagnose while we're alive. Check. So there's nothing we can do about yeah. it. But there's people, both combat and non-combat related now, 
that are having these hallucinations that one football player pulled all the teeth out of his head. His yeah. wife had to leave because it became a dangerous situation. Yeah. And so that's why I want to ask if you have a big blow to the head, we don't know what the brain, how the brain reacts to these things. And you know, myself, you know, me, I started having grand mal seizures right after I retired yeah. uh, from, from what they're saying is permanent brain lesions on my front, frontal uh, lobe. on my frontal lobe. And um, it affects my memory. Like I'll have a, I'll have a uh, conversation with my wife and it could be something stupid, right? Like, Hey, can you pick me up, you know, X, Y, and Z from the grocery store. And then I get home without it. She's like, didn't you? And it's like, it's not that I forgot. It's I had zero recollection of that even happened. conversation even taking place. And then you, then it's the frustration game. And then it's, you know, and it's, um, you know, to go from somebody who is operating as a high, high op tempo all the time, going all the time, getting after it to somebody who can't remember a simple, task um, task sometimes it's like you know and it's not like your your brain your brain and body start to fail you it's not you it's not yourself right yeah and so that becomes difficult and then it becomes frustrating and can exacerbate the symptoms because you're focusing more on it now and um i only bring that up because it's something that i deal with too and 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 the medical profession still trying to figure it out so yeah it's some after the after the infection i had some neurological testing done and obviously they you know they thought it was maybe early onset of dementia uh mainly the trauma mm. you know mm -hmm. we don't talk about complex ptsd which would be like military trauma fire department trauma, EMS trauma, childhood trauma, childhood trauma, everything's compiled on each other and it has over 44 years. You know mm -hmm, what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, but you still sit here with a wall of sheer beauty and a positive attitude absolutely. and a helping attitude. Um, in spite of 44 years of compound complex PTSD and, yeah. and experiences and, to take somebody like you, I want to breathe the language and the sights of you because there's other firefighters and other paramedics and other police officers, especially police officers and firefighters right now, that are now living in a different time where they were revered 20 years ago on 9-11 as the heroes of the day and giving the full measure uh, of their of their self for their country and for their uh, compatriots and their citizens and their they look at that and, and the next day we revered them on 912 and in 20 years we get to a point where they'll come up and you know people will mess with firefighters will mess with police want to defund and take money from them and it's like so now it's a pretty contentious time and these people are still out there towing the line bop bop getting end step and doing and being being the heroes that we need them to be and so if you're out there and uh and maybe you're experiencing some of this stuff uh, we need to change the stigma on mental health and mental health awareness. It's something Absolutely. that we've been doing for some time. And this is another reason that we put this podcast together. Another special reason why I want to have you on because, uh, PTSD doesn't always come from war on this podcast. We talk to a lot of guys that have stitched people up, um, been over to war, seen crazy things with their eyes. And I don't want it to be forgotten about that. We have just as many of those first responders back here that on a daily basis in our medical field, all the way through COVID who's now being treated badly and poorly because of policy decisions. And it's like, it, can we hit the reset and realize that these people are helping they're healthy and they're helping They're uh, they're, they're not trying to be political. They're strictly there to help people and try to save lives and let's just, can we maybe get back to just letting them do that yeah. um, is, is the way I feel about it. And so, I, I, you know, big, big thrust for having you on was to breathe language to people that are likewise in your situation. And maybe it wasn't in the Army, maybe it wasn't in the Marine Corps and downrange, but maybe they're right here at home taking care of, uh, you know, cadaver diving, 9-11 uh, uh, situations, the, the, uh, the uh, Alfred P. Morris building. Uh, which I know you were intimately. Yeah, I was in high school. In. I wasn't. I wasn't intimately involved in. It, but I say that because you were out there, and it probably hit a little bit more home than that was my nine eleven. Maybe for us, right? Like and when so, you got when you were ready to join uh, after the Merle. The catalyst. Was, that was the catalyst that really drove it. I was in high school that morning, and my one of my English teachers' daughter was like two buildings down, and you know she was distraught, and it was just I was teaching art. That was one of my senior electives mm -hmm. was to teach junior high art. That's all they had was junior high art. They didn't have high school arts. So mm -hmm. One of my elective hours because I had enough electives was to go in there and 
sat around for an hour and helped them draw and mm-hmm. do artwork. So mm-hmm. even then, you know, I was trying to help people. I've always tried to help people, even with my mom. That's what started it. Well, you've been a helper since you can remember. Yeah. Uh, virtually, you've or been in, in the service of other people. Yeah. It's amazing. Yep. Amazing. Matt, you got anything? What position did you play in baseball? I pitched, believe it or not, and then I played left field as big as I was. That's you had, you that's had a the hell wheels. Of a conversation. You had the wheels. Uh, that's the only thing combination I right there. Yeah, that's <laughs> the only, that's only, the run was the only thing I passed when I got to base. <laughs> the push ups and setups I didn't do so hot. The run I passed, and I, hey, fat body, why are you run so fast? And so then they put me because in the, you told me to. <laughs> <laughs> and then they put me in the A group. And then I was running with these guys. And so, yeah, uh, running. I th- when I was in Afghanistan, I, I ran over 690 miles in 13 months. But who's counting? Who's right. counting? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you didn't have anything to do. Before. Are you calling out David Goggins, too? No. Okay. Because okay. <laughs> that, that happened last night on our show, on one of our recordings with... Uh, with uh, well, you'll just have uh, to a mutual friend of ours, Johnny yeah. Motherfucking Glenn. I know. Recorded and he called out David Goggins, said he wears ass out on the pavement. Yep. So, and, <laughs> so me we and see, him were like, we'll see if we can mm-hmm. facilitate a little competition. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't no competition runner. Uh, friendly, uh, a friendly little army navy uh, competition of sorts that we're going to try to put up, uh, all in fun, and maybe we even make it uh, to charity. Yeah, you know, charity we, we'll something. get a charity They'll going on that. for them. No uh, 100%. Yeah. Both of them are great. Um, but uh, so baseball, left field, and pitch. And, and I'm, sure you, I'm sure you could bring the ball down because you've got a big frame and a pitcher yeah. that's tall, you know, 6'4 plus 3 feet. You've got a long whip coming I down. Play, I played with a guy that uh, his name is Carl. He was high hand catcher, and he threw. I think they clocked him. I want to say around ninety from mm. home plate from his knees. Mm-hmm. I threw in the mid, probably upper eighties. Yeah, that's what I did. I pitched. I, I think uh, I oh, think well, the I fastest nothing. was probably high eighties, low yeah. mid to high eighties. Probably is the but fastest. I threw a knuckle. I threw a knuckleball. I threw a curveball. I threw a slider. So you could work the work the L as it were. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's so awesome. That I love. I love baseball. I played that from t-ball age on up football was not until junior high and then obviously as i grew and got bigger the uh football was a little more easier and well like you I, just get to run really fast and smash the shit out of somebody right and uh, when you're bigger than everybody and angry was anybody bigger than you yeah man i played it oh really yeah there's this one dude that was like six eight okay uh, he was bigger. supposed to be like we we went up against each other one the first play and i drove him off the ball probably 25 yards and put him on his back <laughs> that was the very first play of the game i was just like you him might know. got four inches but i'm here daddy <laughs> i'm here brother. and this isn't gonna be an easy one for you yeah we're gonna <laughs> but he had long, tussle. <laughs> yeah he had long arm we tussled all game long and so yeah there was did yeah. you wake up black and blue for films i was always black my, <laughs> yeah. my, my uh my forearms, oh yeah, mainly. Oh, know, yeah. I wore like gloves mm-hmm. for my knuckles and my hands. From oh yeah, the, I remember it, films on Saturday morning. Boys, get everybody limping into the locker room to. It'd just be so sore you couldn't move. Oh people, man, people, yeah. Unless you played it, you don't get it. Still, some of the greatest days of my life. Like when I talk to my kids, yeah. I'm like, enjoy your school, because every adult that I know would give everything down right now to go to high school right now and play football again. Like would, make it that easy. Again. I wish I had the same mentality mentality now that I do in in life that I did in high school. Which is? I just would apply myself more. Mm. You know, that's something interesting. I agree too. It's something yeah. interesting because I hear that in a lot school, on the podcast. I, would, I mean, I have five degrees. I'm not bragging. And so I did a lot of college. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't, like, supposed to make it in life. You know what I mean? And so. Maybe that's your perception. Oh, that's what I was told I think by you're some here. people. You know what I mean? I think you're here for. A big reason. A big reason. But. Yeah, yeah. That aside, uh, once you figure out how school works, it's not technically that hard. It's doing what you need to do. And if you can be in the military, that I'm glad I went to the military. I, I'm glad I stopped college, went to the military. The military taught me everything I needed to know to be a man, really. Mm-hmm. Taught me morals, values, how discipline. to treat people, discipline. And then I applied all that discipline to firefighting, EMS, whatever. And now I apply that same discipline to my artwork. There's no, there's no question that the military does something to people in that regard. It gives you personal responsibility, accountability, discipline. Because when you look at people um, that have served, yeah, they're 
a lot of times they're ahead of the ball game on the outside. That's Either, why it's hard for us to come back and start integrating with mm-hmm. uh, you say civilians. I, I'm civilian. American population. American population. It's how you want to look at it. it. It's hard because you're taught these values. You're taught these expectations. You're taught these standards mm-hmm. that you live by. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing less than those standards. Mm-hmm. That is it. That's it. Mm-hmm. And that's where I have to be at. And it's not, you know, it's like you were talking about the artwork earlier. Yeah. You say, yeah, it looks good. And I'm like, yeah, it's all right. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's not to my standard a lot of times. Mm-hmm. And, and any anybody in any art, whether it's writing, painting, speaking, war, uh, they're going to be their own worst critic. Oh, yeah. Right? I, I beat mean, myself up all the time. And, and a lot of people I've heard through the you hey, you got to cut yourself a break. You're, you're just too hard on yourself. And it's like, uh, you know, name me one Olympian that wasn't their own worst critic. Name one. You won't find the one. Because people... In that mindset, that especially when you have the tools, the discipline, the responsibility, and the accountability, once you get on the outside, like like timelines, for example, the military is a hurry up and wait game, but they also instill the reason why we hurry up and be on time and be a little bit early is because when you're 60 seconds late in the wrong situation, it's a body bag. You're putting a frame in a zipper. And then you get out here and 60 to 80% of people don't have don't have that in them. Um, was not their fault. No. They just didn't get it. And then you have to work into that, right? And yeah. and so I'd say on, on a big scale, um, it's up to the people who have, in military or not, who have the discipline, who have the responsibility and accountability to speak up because you're going to enhance for the better. it will be a net positive for everybody if you can get your other workers to 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 toe that same line have that same standard and and i think that's why your art speaks louder than a lot of people's that i've seen because you you'll sit down and spend 60 straight hours on it not straight consecutive but you'll spend 60 hours on it and at the end of the day say yeah that hair could just be a little bit better Mm -hmm. or i'm gonna black this out because it just isn't where i wanted it to be and then you have you know art like you see on the wall and like you guys will see on the Facebook, that's absolutely breathtaking. And it's like, yep, that, you were, this is what you're supposed to do. See, like the wall behind you is the second hand art. Mm-hmm. It's really not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I look at it like, I, I know what I was doing in my life when I was doing that, mm-hmm. but it's not really what I want to put out. Right. And there's certain things that I do put out and certain things that, uh, I don't show. It's, uh, there's a very seldom of that I do, that I make. There's some there's some things that um, I struggle with about wanting to paint mm-hmm. that would be I think to understand maybe a view of a uh, first responder, mm-hmm. but to paint something so graphic and it's like these images in my head, you know what I mean? It's like I'm not sure I can do that. So a lot of things I paint is. Uh, it depends on the process. So, like, I get different imagery that comes to me, mm-hmm. like certain images, like either they're all the time. It's always in my mind, that, mm-hmm. like that would look cool. This would be cool. Or I surf the internet and I say, "Well, I can take that and this and make that." And mm-hmm. The process never stops. It never stops. Mm-hmm. And so it's like one thing to another. And I work on multiple pieces at different times, and, and they all serve the purpose of doing something different. You and, just had a uh, pretty. You just you just you just uh, dealt out a pretty impressive painting to a pretty impressive person uh, just last week. Was it last week? Uh, a couple of weeks now. A couple of weeks, ago. weeks ago, and yeah. and talk about that a little bit. Well, I was uh, I was asked to represent so uh, as a veteran. Uh, I got to meet the first lady. Is what what it come down to? She came to talk to some spouses. And veterans and veterans slash spouses that are, are both about uh, services rendered or getting services for whether it's during deployment, whether it's mental health, whether it's caretaker mental health, whether it's art therapy, mm-hmm. whether it's whatever you're getting about services. So mm-hmm. that's really what the meeting was with the first lady. Uh, I, I talked about art. That's what I was there for. Mm-hmm. I had uh, a couple of pieces of art there. One was for her to get. Which was a little bit of a fiasco, but she got it. But uh, and then one was they came in when they came into the vet center. They saw it. They're like, "Hey, we want to check that out." And so it's kind of representing the art group. 
Good to go. And and uh, the first lady was in town in Jacksonville, also I think to console some of the. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, some she's, of the Marines over yeah, on Lejeune. That and, what happened with the 13th yep. passed away during the bombing. Yep. Yeah, and so um, excited that you got to, you know, be a part of that and maybe give a little bit of your, you I, know, your, yeah, your art to. I, uh, it was to me. It's like I try. I try to give a lot of art away. Mm. Uh, you've gotten pieces of art. Mm-hmm. Uh, certain only certain people in my life that are special to me get art mm-hmm. uh, without buying it. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. yeah, uh, I got some of your art on my me wall. <laughs> yeah, and it's for taking care of me in more than one situation. So, uh, yeah. So certain people get it. Certain people don't. Uh, certain people have asked. And do you commission? Like, will you will you build a piece of art for somebody? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, at price, obviously, not for free. But if you've got a piece of art that you're interested in, you see art on the wall, and you like the inspiration, then you can absolutely get a piece commissioned. Yeah. And uh, we'll Capitalism, put, baby. We're going to put all of uh, Robert's you know, pictures and stuff up, but I'll also link all of his social medias. Um, to where you can find art and actually reach out and DM him if this is something that you're into. If you see something on the wall that you're into, you know, reach out to him. Uh, this guy's a phenomenal, phenomenal artist, phenomenal person, genuine person, and uh, and we want to make sure that anybody that wants your art has an opportunity to get you, to get after it. And you know, you don't always do. I see behind you on the wall, you got some live oak uh, pieces. That's, that's a base wood, and it's a mm-hmm. so, it's a the rings are so tight that when you burn it. Yeah, I do wood burnings, but it's wood burning. It's wood mm-hmm. pyro something. I, I forget the word for it, but it's wood burning. Wood burning, and and I use stippling, which is a method of dots. Mm-hmm. And then I take the wood burner and different. I hold it at different levels and different depths, and it gets hotter and not lighter. And then I can dial the wood burner in. And that's how you can control shading. So, and, just shading. Mm-hmm. I dial the wood burner into us. I got them marked where I want them to be. They burn different. I've done a bunch of test burns, and then. I have these marks on my wood burner, and I put it to you know dark to be dark, and then medium, then light, and then I fill in between. Mm-hmm. And it's just dots over dots. It's almost like my arm is a tattoo gun. Mm-hmm. Same mm-hmm. principle. The needles in. Which and is out. something you also did. So that's something yeah. I had, I had a tattoo in. shop. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. In Oklahoma. Yep. I don't do that anymore. Uh, it's like a lost art too. You know, if you're not doing it every day. Perishable skills. Perishable, perishable skills. skills. Mm-hmm. Gradation <clears throat> and everything with the with yeah, the and it's so needles. much. It's so much different. I mean. Then drawing on a canvas, mm-hmm. you know, when he starts drawing on somebody's skin, you know, different skin texture, different body types, different mm-hmm. elasticity of the skin, mm-hmm. how well they're going to hold ink, yep. you know, stuff like that. But I did that for a while. I enjoyed it. But that was really kind of the art that I was doing between my career in the fire department. I wasn't doing a whole lot. Sure, but sure. I had the shop. And mm-hmm. I would draw. I would piddle and tinker and sketch out things in my head or whatever. And then. Really, after the sickness, it was kind of shut that down. Well, not shut that down, but that's when everything blew up for like, this other side. Yeah. yeah, for this other side of me, that's now the artistic. That's what I tell people I'm an artist now. Check, man. Um, I, I got something. Yeah, yeah, we got for you in the creative process. Is it the is it the journey or the ending? Because I, when I build furniture or when yeah. I do a project, I get to the end and I'm like. I don't want to be done. Like I want to continue. And then it's like, all right, I put that one to the side and I start on the next one. You know, is it the journey or the, or the end? It's both. Yeah. Cause every, here's the thing. Every painting is something new that I have to teach myself. Yeah. Right. So not every painting is the same. I, you, you still learn how to blend and shade and look at depth and perspective. And that's all going to be the same, but each painting is different. And that's, that's why I try to paint so much different stuff. I'm not like, yeah. I don't want to just do landscapes like Bob Ross. I don't want anybody putting you in a box anymore. Right. Yeah. You want to make your own box. Yeah. I want to, and that's where greatness comes in. Jordan Peterson talks about the art, the artist, yeah. uh, the side of the world that brings us beauty, right? And he talks about um, Toronto, Canada, which is where he works. He's a, he, yeah. was a, he was a tenured professor at Toronto. And now he's, I think he's take, taking kind of a sabbatical to do his speaking and to do his into, intellectual, you know, tours. Um, but he talks about how when he goes to these other cities, he's toured like some hundred plus cities where he's given talks at, right? Yeah. And when he goes to these cities and some of them, he talks about they're absolutely beautiful from the sculptures to the architecture to all this. And then he talks about Toronto. He's like, Toronto's lame. Like, this is not a beautiful city. <laughs> and we, and it could be, right? And he yeah. talks about the um, 
the benefits that come from the beauty of artistic expression and the amount of different things throughout time that have held from Picasso to Michelangelo to, you know, things at the Sistine Ta- Chapel. Th- these these things are timeless, right? Yeah. The Mona Lisa, for, for example. And these things have, have held the test of time and are still being hung in some of the most rich elite and why. So there's a reason behind all that. Well, we talk about you look at the first cultures. I, I, I was doing a little research before we did the podcast about art and, and cultures, and it's been around forever. Cave drawings, mm-hmm. mu- music, mm-hmm. uh, journaling, telling stories. Mm-hmm. It's been around, so it serves a purpose for everyone. Sure. And uh, you know, the positive things from art is you get good endorphins, serotonin, dopamine. So within 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you can almost be the same mimicking effects of morphine. Mm. And so art does that. So if people will give art a chance, whether you can draw or not draw, if you're doing something creative for 35, 40 minutes, you're going to benefit from that. Benefits it helps become. relieve anxiety, depression, PTSD, stress. They use it in Walter Reed. Mm. That's what I also talked about the first lady about. She's like, she was visiting Walter Reed the day after. She's like, yeah, they have amazing art therapy, you know, and then... Mm. And she'd ask me if I could send anything back to the present when I was at more funding for art, you know, and make more things available for veterans for art. And, and I've talked about this multiple times to different people that are different people that, you know, if I could get a couple hundred thousand dollar grant, man, I would open up a place that would be open every day mm-hmm. for veterans to come in. Just be that place where they could come, come in and in work and, on art. Yeah. 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 And would you do strictly painting or any kind of art that they wanted that you could that you could facilitate clay or I know a lot of guys are into clay or yeah I mean the, sculpting there's you know there's different oil painting watercolors I mean you go through the different mediums and then you know I would like a place where the, you know they could do that and mm-hmm. it, just come in so I mean if you look at renting a place for a year or two paying that out and then just buying your supplies you know there's not much overhead mm-hmm. and and what about um I know we were talking with. Um, our, our guy over at, we're leaving nameless for now, but let's say the head over at our vet center where, where we do some counseling and we got a new building coming in. Have you talked to him about having like a more, um, a more in depth or a more resourceful art program than what we have now at this new building with the money and resources they're getting? Yeah. We're, they've increased the art program to two days a week now. Mm-hmm. And you know, we're talking about doing a big mural in that building, mm-hmm. the art group mm-hmm. is going to be doing. So, I don't know how extensive we're going to go. We're talking about maybe representing all the conflicts from World War II up. I don't think there's many World War I veterans, nothing against them. but I mean, we're running out of World War II now. Yeah, so the vet center kind of really just helps from World War II on. Mm-hmm. And so those conflicts and just try to represent them. And, like, I wanted to take, like, just badass pictures, you know what I mean? Not, like, triggering events, but just bad pictures that, like, awesome looking pictures and just paint them a, like different soldiers and female soldiers like maybe a nurse in Vietnam or somebody in Korea and then somebody in World War II yes, in Vietnam Korea Afghanistan Desert Storm Desert Shield Iraq and just try to represent men and women of the service mm. and that's kind of beautiful that's kind of what we're thinking about doing and hopefully that's going to go down and when it when it does it's going to be cool to see yeah so. we'll definitely have you back on and we'll maybe even get up there and and show that if, if we can or something. yeah, yeah it's not going to be anything soon any, you no no i know yeah i know i know it's yeah, going to take a little time to this paint. is forever project right here yeah, yeah yeah i got years years on years decades <laughs> so uh at the end of each episode uh i try to kind of give the guests the last uh parting shots i want you to you know look right into your camera and just talk to veterans of not just the military but of the fire uh, firefighting line of the paramedic line of the uh, of the uh, medic line and just talk to them uh, give them the message that you want to that that you want them to know well I can say if you could get any message that I would give would be to seek therapy sooner than later yeah uh, I, I had some therapy on and off over 10 years before re- it took about 10 years before I really came to the terms that I was I suffered from PTSD and to really start getting some help from the VA and mm-hmm down that line and individual help but there's help out there and don't be afraid to ask for it if you're trying to find some of the help and resources that we have talked about on on this podcast 
go ahead and check out the description of this video or you can go to our Facebook or Instagram pages of Choices Not Chances. Um, you can find us there and all of the links to the Vet Center, the Art Council, social media links to Robert's social media page. You can check that out and even reach out to him for commissioning painting. All of that's going to be in the description and on our Facebook uh, and Instagram pages. Please you know, browse the art. Uh, and, and and let Robert know what you think. And if you want to get something commissioned, definitely uh, drop a DM in his box, and and uh, and then he'll start fielding those as he gets them, and uh, and working with you. But uh, for choices, not chances, guys. We appreciate you being here, and uh, Robert. Uh, I appreciate it, man. Affectionately, Shrek, my friend, dear friend to me. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for what you do with art, and what you do on a daily basis, trying to improve the lives of other people. Uh, it's a huge thing, man. So I appreciate it. And with that, we'll catch you guys next time on Choices, Not Chances. Thank you. Thank you. Boom. How we doing, everybody? This is the co-host of Choices, Not Chances podcast, Matthew Charette. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Louisiana Gun Shop. The folks at Louisiana Gun Shop have been a longtime supplier of firearms and shooting supplies and services, as well as very good friends of mine. In episode seven of the podcast, we interviewed the owner and founder, Harlan Bodlett. At Louisiana Gun Shop, the sky is the limit when it comes to getting the firearms and accessories you want for your current or future firearms. They have a nice selection of handguns, rifles, and shotguns in stock or can order just about any firearm you could want or need. They specialize in concealed carry handguns and custom AR-15 builds. In addition to firearms, they also carry ammo, suppressors, optics, and a wide variety of gun parts for the upgrade and maintenance of your firearm. If you want to get further in the upgrade side of things, they provide customization services such as Cerakote, laser engraving, and Kydex holsters. Louisiana Gun Shop is located on Highway 90 West in Broussard, Louisiana, just south of Lafayette. It used to be Louisiana Gun Shop did not have an online presence. But now I am happy to announce that their website is up and ready for business for online sales to all 50 states at louisianagunshop.com slash pages slash CNC. Louisiana Gun Shop also offers Louisiana residents concealed carry classes for a very reasonable price. Holland's experience in the concealed carry space when it comes to the laws and the do's and the don'ts is pivotal in attaining your Louisiana concealed carry license. As well as the firearm market, Harlan also conducts explosives training for Louisiana blasters licenses for oil field and special effects workers in Louisiana. Workers in these fields from out of state also need to have this training in order to complete work in Louisiana. So whether you need a firearm, upgrade your old firearm, targets and ammo for a range day, or you just like to talk to people who support the Second Amendment, Louisiana Gun Shop is your place, either in person or online, Remember, they are located on Highway 90 West in Broussard, Louisiana, just south of Lafayette, or online at louisianagunshop.com slash pages slash CNC. Check the episode description for the link. You can also follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Louisiana Gun Shop. A special thanks to Harlan and Jenny at Louisiana Gun Shop for sponsoring the show. Please support them so they can support us and keep the podcast free for all. Thanks, have a great day, Semper Fi, and God bless America. Not too far. You're marking the building. Hit him. Yeah, that's good. That's a good shot. That's a funny. Yeah.